Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, today we are finally here. We have reached uh, episode one of season one of House of the Dragon and I am very excited uh, and I'm particularly excited by my special guest today who is the legend, the one, the only, Matt Jamie Magician. Hi, do you want to introduce yourself for anyone who does not know who you are? Who, who doesn't know me in this stream at this point? There's so many times we've been together, Robert. We've done so much work together. And actually, fun fact, people have been going back and watching some of my old videos, and they're like, is that Robert on that video? I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> it is Indie Geek. Uh, yeah, I am Matt, also known as Joe Magician. I am a fellow Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, I guess, Hot D YouTuber at this point. Uh, streams, videos, lots of theories, lots of uh, crackpot tinfoil, I suppose. I think that's what Robert would consider most of my channel, so um yeah all that good stuff um i i would not say crank crackpot or tinfoil <laughs> i i i often say that your channel is uh uh coming at things from a slightly different angle which i think is an excellent uh thing for for a community that <laughs> that often has a little bit of group think that we're all we all kind of circulate around uh, the same kind of ideas and it's good to have people who can uh, uh just give a little bit of a different angle on things and one of the things i know that you've been focusing on we will come to this a little bit later mm -hmm. is this whole idea of sort of dragon dreams and things like that um so oh, i came at that from a different angle <laughs> you you definitely like like so many other things uh so i'm i'm very excited about it. um a couple of just little bits of logistics to start with um i i have a i don't know it's not really a confession but i have seen the episode um this was i was not expecting to see the episode i did it i explained this to gave the story to matt just before we came on air ages ago months ago i shot a few emails off to hbo thinking you know what I, I, the channel's grown a little bit since uh, game of thrones season. Like maybe like maybe uh i i now in in Big enough that uh, I can be one of those people who gets some of these screeners beforehand. I got nothing back, literally nothing back from them. I thought, well, it was worth a shot. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And then two days ago, out of the blue, I got an email with just, hey, here's your link, which unfortunately then sent me down this crazy little route of you have to sign up, you have to get a password, you have to then go off and do a, an ID check on something, and I was locked out of it, and I was in this horrible new definition of frustration. They wanted me to see it, I wanted to see it, uh, but I couldn't see it. Eventually, I did manage to get to see it literally this afternoon, my <laughs> time, so I've seen it relatively recently, um, but it does give me the opportunity to, to say all of these live streams from now on all the way through the season these are show spoiler free um as much as is possible and what i mean by that is if it's in the books if george R. R. martin has been talking about it if it's in the trailers then that's fair game that's what we will happily talk about here that's what we'll get excited about here but uh, we uh, we're not going to be telling you what exactly happens in the episode which is coming up even if we happen to know it um, and in this Matt doesn't know what's coming up in the episode. No, uh, I have, I've got <laughs> nothing. Uh, I am not fortunate enough to get screeners. Although apparently, I just have to send an email. I'm just going to go ahead and ask you to give me that email after the uh, after the stream. I'm going to hook myself up with some screeners. Um, but yeah, it, the episode leaked this afternoon. Somebody put it on torrents and all that stuff. So you can just go watch it if you want, or you can just wait till nine like a normal person. Um, but yeah, I I literally know nothing except for one thing that we're going to talk about, which was spoiled but then george just said it so that's all i got yeah i mean and uh, i mean i came across that this is the the dragon dreams thing which mm -hmm. we talked about on my live stream and i mean it, it was a couple of weeks or so ago uh this is i don't think this is a spoiler in my world um uh, because this is something george has been talking about it has been in the trailers but we will come to that in just mm -hmm. one moment um the other thing to note is that this is a charity stream all of my live streams for both uh, House of the Dragon and also the Rings of Power will be charity streams, uh, pre-show uh, live streams will be charity streams in aid of Alzheimer's care and research. Alzheimer's is, if you've ever come across it, been experienced anyone with it, it is a horrible disease. So uh, a yeah. little bit of money goes a huge uh, way with this. So if you are able, please do uh, be generous with that. Um, 
I'll try and shout out any names if uh, if they're there. And uh, uh, but it does mean we don't have any super chats, but we will be keeping an eye on the chat anyway. Uh, so uh, if there's uh, if you've got a question, do drop it in there, and hopefully we will spot it. Um, okay, why don't we just start though, uh, Matt? I know you're sort of coming at this mm -hmm. completely fresh. What are you? What are your hopes for for House of the Dragon as a whole? What what are you Ooh. what are you expecting? Oh, starting starting big and wide, huh? Um... Well, before I answer, yeah, your Alzheimer's care thing is something very near and dear to my heart. My uh, my grandmother, who died in the spring, had this, and it was terrifying to live through, and it was a horrible thing. So, yeah, give what you can. All the research to try and not let that happen to another person would be appreciated. Um, but as for what I'm expecting from House of the Dragon, I mean, it's sort of... It's a, it's a funny one because you already know what's there. We we know fire and blood. We know the basically like the show outline of where it's gonna go. So there's like there's particular moments I'm looking forward to, like particularly um, a particular fire at Heron Hall, maybe a meeting on the Isle of Faces, that kind of stuff. But I think my overall goal is I want the fandom to be alive again. I want it to kind of come back from kind of the super divided really angry place it was in the last few seasons where um you know it, it was uh a lot of of what being a fan of game of thrones at those times where was were you a fan or you were an anti or something like that and i would rather see just everyone really excited to have a great show that we can all enjoy together again so i i guess that's like the high visibility the high the overarching thing i want from house of the dragon i want <laughs> I want that like uh, super happy, positive fandom back again. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. It's um, and all of the build up to this, I have to say, HBO have got this absolutely right. It's it has turned so many people I know who were really turned off from this after season eight. Yeah, just suddenly admitting that they're excited again, and that mm -hmm. I think is a, a, a fantastic thing. And um, somebody in the chat, let's just uh, see whether I can uh, find the name. Um, Curtis Franks saying, maybe just give us one spoiler. Does it look promising or good? What what I what, the one thing I will say, I enjoyed it. That's something that I will I will happily say. I don't think that's a spoiler. It was as far as I'm concerned, it was everything I was hoping for. It was it was really good. So you will have heard that I'm sure from plenty of other people who've seen this in various ways. Um, I get the impression this is one for the fans. This is one that if you love these books, if you love the world of George R. R. Martin, if you're a geek who's read all of this, then you will really get this. If you're just a casual fan, maybe you just think, yeah, that's good. But if you love it, then you will really uh, love it. That's kind of the impression um, I got from a lot of reviews that I read uh, from people in the reviewers that I trust who I usually agree with, they basically said the same thing. It's going to be this season in particular. Well, the first six episodes are a little rough for the casual fans because it's going to jump time quite a lot. We're, we're covering 28 years or something like that. Mm. But after that, after like episodes seven and then to seasons two and three, it's going to get back to what the, what the casual audience for game of Thrones loves. But these six episodes on the flip side are going to be exactly what we love. It's going to be super detailed. It's going to be the characters you want. Obviously, Ryan Condal and Miguel Shapochnik and all their team have put tons of effort into making sure they're getting granular details that people love. So um, I have not heard any bad reviews from dedicated fans. No, and I would second that. It's I, I, I genuinely, I think I've now found one or two bad reviews, but they don't seem to be people who liked Game of Thrones in the first place. So it fine. doesn't. Really surprise me all that much. Um, <laughs> quick shout out to Arilhon. Thank you very much for the donation. Uh, quite a few anonymous ones. Lucas, George, Atkin Hill, um, and as uh, Vibo, and I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for for donating. As I say, it's a it's a very worthy cause. Um, let's. I as as I always try and do. I, I'm going to try and shape this around a few questions I get from my patrons and i'll say up front patrons thank you uh this is uh my way of thanking you for for your support i cannot do what i do without your support and one way i try and show my thanks is by prioritizing your questions let's go with the question um from 
Emma Scheinman saying, my question is about the Great Council of 101. I know the show will start there, George R. Martin has said that, um, to establish some of the political precedents and old grudges that will be important later on. I'm wondering which major characters will actually be present. As far as I can recall from Fire and Blood, the only people who will go on, who were there, who will go on to be central in the dance are Viserys and the Velaryons. Are there any others? Uh, Matt, I don't know whether you had a chance to sort of dig into this. I'll, I'll, throw, I'll throw one name in. Um, <laughs> okay. I don't know whether you can think of any other ones. Um, uh, Daemon uh, Targaryen was, right. uh, was there or thereabouts, and he... Um, true to form he was uh rumored to be sort of potentially gathering an army in case the result went the wrong way mm -hmm. uh so he was around there he was very supportive obviously of his brother uh so he was definitely involved uh as well uh matt are there any other names that that you would want to sort of throw in there Otto hightower is a big one the guy who probably yeah. threw the vote for viserys i mean that's been speculated for a long time it is so convenient that he continues to be handed the king for Viserys and then Viserys narrates his daughter um been speculated for a while that the hand of the king made the vote kind of go the way Jaehaerys did I mean obviously Robert knows I don't at this point I don't know how the vote went but um <laughs> also kind of Rhaenyra isn't Emma, Emma Emma Aaron pregnant during this so I guess she's there <laughs> Uh, yeah, no I mean, way. I don't know if that's there is, is that how, how you count it, but yeah, I think Emma Emma Aaron is is pregnant at the time. Certainly, it's um. So Rhaenyra, she's there. She's a big part. Nailed it. <laughs> uh, Maester, yeah. I, guess, I mean, Septon Barth should be dead during this time, but there's always Maesters, Grand Maesters, High Septons, that kind of thing. So there's and it's gonna be a lot of lords. Like we're probably gonna see a lot of the characters that swear to Rhaenyra. The at least the older ones will have been at the Great Council. So that would be like maybe the Baratheons, um, that kind of thing. Yes, and there's one other name um, which has got, uh, it, it's important a little bit later actually when we get into the dance, it probably won't, this person probably won't figure at all, I wouldn't imagine in season one, Grover Tully. Now oh, House yeah, Tully, uh, House Tully are, you know who, who they are, they're House Paramount in the Riverlands, but they're, also not the most powerful or the oldest or the richest or mm -hmm. anything really of the houses they just happened to have been the first to support the targaryens and so they got put there um back at the invasion grover tully uh, is the he's an old man at the time of uh, the great council of 101 um and when we get to the Dance of the Dragons, he's an even older man, uh, mm -hmm. but he's clinging on to life uh, for for dear breath. And he's he's a green, he's a diehard green, um, but his, it's not even his sons, it's his grandsons who will take over are on the other side. And so actually this is quite important because the Tullys they don't really do much. They just kind of like sit in their castle for a very long time waiting for like, the the granddad to die and then they can come out and do a few things so um yeah he's he is there um but we probably won't see him in in season one at all yeah the tollies are in a, a weird spot during the dance um the tyrells are kind of in a similar situation where we forget looking at it from the perspective of a song of ice and fire and game of thrones we think of them as the great powers in the realm the tollies with their fists on the riverlands and the tyrells running all the richest realm in the uh, seven kingdoms but at this time it's only been like a hundred years they a lot of their vassals don't really think that much of them at this point it is during the dance and the following conflicts where they establish themselves as the houses we know yeah exactly um a couple more people uh donating thank you very much for to brian's fat sister and uh, I'm sure there was somebody else I missed as well. Uh, apologies uh, for that. But um, uh, Clueless Fangirl, hi there. I see you in the chat. Uh, good to see you. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Lady Pushkins. Uh, this is this is about House Hightower, um, who I know this is again one of the one of the houses you've taken quite an interest in, Matt, yes. um, asking what, if any, jiggery-pokery shenanigans, this is Lady Pushkin's words, not mine, were going on um, at the Citadel around this time. Um, and for those who are unaware of House Hightower, because they weren't in Game of Thrones, no. um, they are in the books, they're very 
important in the books, although quite quiet still. Um, House Hightower are the oldest. George R. R. Martin, I think it's the first time he said it explicitly, the oldest house in Westeros. He said, he clarified recently. And they are the lords of Old Town, which is the oldest proper settlement in Westeros. They've got that high tower. You remember Sam went there um, in the show. This is where uh, the Citadel is. This is at the time still the home base of the Faith of the Seven. The Starry Sept is based there. The Great Sept of Baylor has not happened yet in King's Landing. Baylor hasn't happened. So um, at the time, Old Town still is the the hub of so much of what is going on, which makes the High Towers, even though they are not Lord pa Lords Paramount of the Reach, they are hugely rich, they are hugely powerful, they are hugely influential. And they've just stuck there in their area, not overextending themselves for millennia. Um, Matt, what's your take? You kind of hinted a little bit about there was a little bit of uh, to use the phrase again, jiggery pokery potentially going on, getting like Otto that, Hightower like that, <laughs> getting Otto Hightower to be hand of the king. But what what's your take on what what is the role in House Hightower here? Is this just Otto heading off on his own, doing his own thing, or is this some big House Hightower game that they've got going on? So this is one of those fun questions where it's sort of revealing about kind of how you view conspiracies, I guess. Because if you're the sort of person that really leans into them, it's really easy to see widespread in, uh, conspiracies coming out of the High Tower, the Citadel, and the uh, Starry Sept. But it's one of, the, but it also can go the other way, where if you look at the actual characters um, in terms of what they're doing, in particular the Maesters, we we meet a lot of Maesters, and none of them are like secretly like going hail House, House High Tower or anything like that. <laughs> Um, even ones we've seen inside the mind of aren't really thinking that way. So, but there is definitely a political element to what's going on with the high towers, and it's that they never go to war, but they always fight in court, and they usually win. And the reason they do that is because they kind of have, well, I said Hydra, but they actually are kind of, they're kind of a three headed dragon of their own between the, the Citadel, the uh, Starry Sept, and themselves. One of the three of them is always pushing on either. Well, it would have been the gardeners, but now the Iron Throne. And they try to win through quite a lot of court politics. They try to do a lot of power marriages. And when those don't work, they send the Septons after them. And when the Septons don't work, conceivably they send the Maesters after them. And they always have their ears in the uh, kings of Westeros, particularly Jaehaerys. Jaehaerys' big thing is that he healed the schism with the faith. So high, the High Towers and um, Old Town in particular have a huge influence at this time which is actually mostly gone by the time we see a uh, regular Game of Thrones. But this is the height of their power. Like, that's one of the things they've been talking about in all the promos. They're like, this is the height of the decadence for Targaryen power. This is the height of high tower power. It all goes down after this. But there's definitely a sense that um, Sir Otto, not the Lord of High Tower, that he's sort of trying to build a new dynasty for himself. And he has the full support of his family when he goes to do it. So... Even though it's like, oh, it's just the hand of the king. Oh, it's just a marriage with Alicent or something like that. There definitely is a plan being enacted by Otto. And that's one of the reasons he sort of comes off being one of the major villains probably in season one. Because it's so self-serving in a way. And in terms of, but the question is, I guess to getting back with the jiggery pokery from uh, mm -hmm. Lady Pushkins, is how much do the maesters have to do with this? And... That's a good question because the Targaryens have a long history of killing maesters. They cut off a lot of their heads. They, um, I think it happens during the dance, doesn't it? Don't a few of them, don't a few grand maesters die or something? Oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. They, they get through at least three. Um, yeah. Magor killed a bunch. It's, it's a whole thing. So the Targaryens are distrustful of the maesters and they never forget that the reason the Citadel exists, the reason that they, uh, are able to send out so many people is the is because of the um, the money coming from Old Town and House High Tower. So they they are very distrustful of them, and I guess we're going to see this is something that's sort of missing from Fire and Blood because it's written from obviously the perspective of the Maesters, and the implication is they're going to remove any sort of uh, jiggery pokery that they may have had in the 
uh, Dance of the Dragons himself. So this will be our first chance to get the on the ground view of exactly what the Grand Maesters are up to and which side they go with. Obviously, I'm guessing it's going to be the High Towers, but how uh, how explicit and how forceful that is should be something new. Yeah, so, I mean, my take, I would agree completely that the what Otto is doing here, which is a power grab, mm -hmm. whether whether it's the full extent of power grab that we it ends up being him like trying to claim the throne for his grandkids basically um whether it started out with that as the idea i think is open to discussion but clearly the idea of right we're now going to start engaging with the iron throne we want our person there being handled the mm -hmm. king we want uh people so he brought a couple of his kids with him just to talk get them in mm -hmm. uh, into positions of power. He gets his daughter Alicent there. She's being basically handmade to the old king. Um, he gets his son, who he puts in a little bit later, he puts in a position of authority in the gold cloak. So he's clearly trying to put his people into positions of power. Um, so there's definitely that going on. There's also, I am a huge subscriber to the the conspiracy theory that the maesters following the dance then got rid of the dragons poisoned the dragons eggs um we don't need to go into that one here but that's more, that's one of the conspiracy theories i, I completely buy into um but uh, the the issue is is this just an aberration because it feels to me a bit like a a complete change for House Hightower in that they spent all this time, they've stayed pretty much within the walls of Old Town, literally for millennia. They were the strongest, oldest, richest, most powerful. They never really tried to kick out whoever was the Lord Paramount of that area, the king of that area. They were happy staying where they were. And now suddenly they've branched out and they're launching a coup so it does feel a little bit of an aberration which makes me wonder whether yes otto does go there with the blessing of uh of the lord hightower but he's probably pushing it a little bit further than even they were first expecting that's that's my general take on that's it. the uh, second son problem otto has nothing of his own so he's going to try and make the iron throne his to like outshine his brother it's such a common theme with how their inheritance works the second sons either they do nothing or they're going to be crazy crazy ambitious and Otto's the crazy ambitious kind yes absolutely uh sweet melissa thank you so much for the donation san rixian i see you in the chat hi there uh for those who do not know san rixian excellent artist please go do go and check her out if you're watching live i'm sure one of the moderators will put a little link somewhere in there in the chat i think i also saw uh voice of geekdom uh one of the many excellent rings of power uh content creators uh so we've got quite all the glitterati going on in the chat today um <laughs> Roman Lakovets just tweaking up in the chat saying, Damon Targaryen is described as light and darkness in equal parts, but in Fire and Blood, he is mostly shown as brutal and power hungry. What good things has he actually done? Uh, this is, I find this an interesting question because wow. uh, George R. R. Martin does, I wish I had the quote up in front of me, but he, he does, he says he's no one at that time was ever more loved and admired but also despised uh, he was light and darkness in equal measure and he does come across with a lot of darkness quite a lot of gray not huge amounts of light now i'm i'm intrigued i will throw this one to you in just one moment matt what what good has he actually done um i i was intrigued by an interview matt smith gave where he said uh, that he was asked, does, uh, uh, does uh, love, he said, yes, they had long discussions, him and the showrunners, about how much did he want the Iron Throne, how much did he love his, his family, that kind of thing, because that helped him understand the character. And his, his take is that he does love his family, um, which I suspect will probably come out through his performance. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but in terms of light and goodness i think it's one of these things where you look at it and say okay he achieved a lot <laughs> yeah uh kind for of. example he conquered the stepstones and he pushed out some really quite brutal people there maybe he was brutal then himself who knows but he did that the gold cloaks before he established the gold cloaks with their 
gold cloaks, uh, he gave them dignity. This is what we're told. The, the city watch wasn't really much of anything to be looking at, but he turned them into a professional unit. He gave them gold cloaks, he equipped them properly, and they loved him for it. So he was admired and followed. Um, whether you count any of those things as good or just competent um is is i suppose up for grabs M matt is there is there sort of some light george martin talks about light what is there any light that you can see in his character i when i think about damon there's robert do you follow sports at all i i do but only good proper european sports oh, okay there's usually a kind of guy on a team where the rest of the league hates them but they're everyone on their team thinks they're the best because they'll always stick up for them they'll always do the dirty things the rest of the team isn't willing to do they're kind of like um everyone else considers them an asshole but then as soon as they go to another team the same thing happens and again they, they kind that guy sort of ends up being somebody everyone rallies around he has tons of loyalty he's the kind of person that um they'll follow anywhere because he'll do anything for them and i think that's mm. kind of the light side of damon it, he is not the kind of person that's going to betray the Targaryen house. He's not going to start a war against Viserys. He's not going to burn the Red Keep. He's not going to go around um, killing the dynasty themselves. He wants more. He definitely wants it. He he makes himself kings of the step zones for a reason. He's not conquering just because he's not ambitious, but he's not willing to do it at the for the... Um, at the cost of destroying themselves. And he's kind of sort of forced into it by the greens in Otto Hightower. And I think if you had to go for a light side, I guess it's kind of that, like a lot of people make the comparison between Damon and Jamie, and you can sort of say the same thing about Jamie. He is all, he's an asshole and people hate him, but he does do what he has to for House Lannister and his children and his sort of wife, I guess. So it, it's kind of like that. I don't think there's any, like, we're going to see any explicitly, like, Damon being a good guy, where it's like, oh, well, he's he's doing things that, uh, like, charity, or he's going around giving everybody high fives, and he's, like, the, the heart of the, the, like, the nicest guy in King's Landing. But I think it's sort of going to be somewhere along that. The, the, um, the guy that the rest of the Targaryens love, everyone else hates. Yeah, I think I think I I agree very much with that. It's and uh, um, Clueless Fangirl uh, just said Zlatan, which will mean yeah. a lot to some people. Actually, um, yeah. uh, not so much to others. Yeah. But yes, I I know exactly uh, what you what you mean there. Chrissy of Oldstones, thank you. Hi there, Chrissy. By the way, um, uh, thank you very much for the donation, Stephen Rocket. Thank you very much for uh, the donation, uh, the Lucille Seven. Uh, thank you as well. Um, Kartik Prabhu saying, shouldn't Joe Magician wear a hat since there are over 200 likes? Um, I think that's an in-joke, but I, I mean, I'd never try and dissuade someone from wearing a hat on air. If my hair um, uh, Sam like second, thank you very much for your uh, donation. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Melissa Moore also, thank you uh, very much. Um, while we're talking about, uh, I'll, I'll move on so you don't feel any pressure to be wearing a hat. And I won't <laughs> mention hats at all from now on at all. Hats. <laughs> um, uh, Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert. Hola. Um, the day is finally here. It, it is indeed. What Fire and Blood character are you most excited to see portrayed on screen? Um, from what we've seen on the trailers, I'm already feeling like the portrayal of Rainus could be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, actually. And this. It does remind me of one, this is a complete digression with no spoilers, I, I promise you. But one thing which watching the episode, it made it reminded me of a thing that I've had at the back of my head for about the last year, which is <laughs> that all of these names we've got here, mm -hmm. I've always I know how I pronounce these names. Uh oh. and I know that I know how the audiobook does, and that's probably influenced how it is. But I always thought there will be some names that on the TV show will be pronounced slightly differently. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they do appear to be pronouncing Rainis Rainis. What? Um, which uh, I don't know whether that was just a person. I'll have to go and see whether that is. And um, 
so uh, how would you i'm intrigued by this how would you pronounce um uh, rainera's dragon's name just uh, so Sorry. Okay, it's Cyrax. I, I said I Cyrax before, it. and now apparently it is Cyrax. That is that is what is uh, they, they say on the show. Oh, so no. there may well be more. Um, it's just complete digression, but it, it just it just made me realise that Ooh. I might have been mispronouncing things all this time because presumably George R. R. Martin had a say in this. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, but Martin pronounces everything wrong. Okay, every name he ever says of a character is exactly the opposite. He says Brian instead of Brienne, and that is wrong. I don't care. <laughs> like his pronunciation. Like the the yeah, this is true. Well, it's it's very true. He does, and he has said that he's quite relaxed about how people pronounce names. Um, well, they're all made uh, up, so you have to sound it out, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but that was a slight digression um, away from uh, <laughs> the question, which is which. Um, which characters are you most excited to see? I mean, I was excited to see Rainis slash Rainis, um, uh, and the the presence is definitely there. Um, in terms of the other characters, obviously Mushroom. Um, we can talk about Mushroom in a moment. Um, uh, but leaving Mushroom aside, I think Laris the Clubfoot Strong mm. is a character that I am fascinated to see. If only at least... Well, from the books, because we never 100% understand his motivations. Um, and in the promotional stuff we've had with the trailers, I think, unless I've blinked and missed it, I think we've only had one very small glance at him sort of hiding away in the back of a scene. Um, uh, he was in a jail cell. He was outside the jail cell looking at somebody in the black cells. Yeah. Exactly, and I think that was the only thing we. And surely he's in it more than that. Um, so I'm really half. looking forward to that. I mean, is there is there a character you're particularly looking forward to seeing? Well, I mean, you took the words out of my mouth. You know, I'm the how strong Stan as it goes. <laughs> I love everything about them from um, their entrance into the story with like one of the first hands of the king, kind of a, a random thing. Learning about Harwin, learning about Lionel, learning about. Uh, Laris, of course, there's the fourth strong of this time, the seeker one, Alice Rivers. That one, <laughs> whenever she shows up, she's going to be fascinating. She sort of takes over the dance as a character because she sort of just like takes aim and just points him where to go and becomes just, I, I want to know more about her and, and Laris, especially because, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly right. There's a quote about Laris where literally George goes like, hmm, nobody's ever figured out what Laris Strong's up to. I wonder what you think. I'm like, oh, you bastard. You know I'm gonna. <laughs> you know I'm gonna want to know uh, exactly what he's into. Like, what's his role in that in that curious fire? Is he actually on the side of the Greens? Why doesn't he support his secret nephews? Why, like, is he actually out for anybody except Laris? It's um, I think he's gonna be really interesting because there's sort of a sense when you're talking about Varys and Littlefinger from the um from A Song of Ice and Fire is they kind of they don't really have a stake in the game, so to speak. Like Varys has this long-term plan of installing a new king, but it's kind of like doing stuff just for doing it. And Littlefinger's just like, oh, I'm just all about chaos, man. I'm just I'm just fighting everybody for some reason. But Laris has a chance to be this kind of um, manipulative character, this spy master person that really has um, something they're after in the dance, which is not something we've seen a whole lot of. So that that's one thing I'm really excited about. And of course, Rainies. Rainies is one of those characters who um, there's not really a lot about her on an interpersonal level. And that's one of the things I was surprised at. I'm sure you were too, looking at the uh, the promos and the teasers where they had her like whispering to Alicent about, wouldn't you be good on the Iron Throne? I'm like, where's this coming from? Yeah. What kind of character are you, Rainies? Is it like somewhere like Olena Tyrell, but with a dragon? That sounds awesome. I want to learn more about her. Um, but def definitely the Strongs. Alice Rivers will be great. And of course, the Blackwoods. I did like five streams on the Blackwoods. Like uh, we're talking about Black Alley, Red Rob Rivers, uh, Bloody Ben. They show up along with the lads like you were talking about with the Tullys more in probably season two or three. But um, I guess that doesn't really count for season one. So I guess I'll just sort of stick with Laris and Rainies as my favorites. To look forward to yeah and i think uh, yeah i most people seem to be coming down in that same lady misery i think is another character mm. who 
actually, when you read the story, only gets mentioned a very small number of times. If you actually just go through and do a search for, for how many times Miseria comes up, not that many. But you get the feeling that she's incredibly important and influential sort of behind the scenes. Um, I did say they're changing her quite a bit from uh, what's in Fire and Blood. I'm guessing that means that what we hear about Lady Misery in Fire and Blood is more um, propaganda, and we're going to see the real Mysaria. Hmm. Which makes yes, sense. you may well be right. I mean, they. this is one of the things, although I am fully confident this is going to be a close adaptation of, <laughs> of what we've had, um, they, do, they will have to expand out. Uh, maybe probably slightly less in this season than they will have to in later seasons um, because they've got quite a lot of material for, for this. But it, I, I haven't counted how many pages in Fire and Blood. It's probably something like a couple of hundred pages. Um, something like that. Yeah, and it's that's if they're going to have this for, I don't know, four seasons, whatever it is that they're going to go for, That's they will have to stretch it when you think that they did one book for one season on season one of Game of Thrones. Um, and that was a big old book. And they, it's, it's all just exactly. like... Exactly. They've got about a quarter of that size for four times the, the amount of screen time. So um, they will have to add in stuff. I, the impression I'm getting is that it's more sort of adding into the character development rather than let's have extra little uh, plot lines going off all over the place. So um, that I'm... Uh, I'm fully behind. Should we have a very brief... Oh, I'm sorry, like, like a Cregan Stark. I want to see Cregan when Jace goes to see him. I want to know everything about Cregan. Yes, yeah, I would I would agree with that. Again, that's going to be... We're going to be season two and then the last season for that, I'm pretty sure. Um, let's have a brief digression into how strong, because as I say, I know this is another one of your passions. Oh. Um, when I was doing... I did a little sort of introduction video, which went live a couple of uh, days ago, and I thought, well, what are the houses that that people don't or might not know about? Obviously, there's House Florian, there's House Hightower. And the third one I thought I did need to mention was House Strong. Um, but the fact is that we've not got... <laughs> here he goes, he's limbering up now. <laughs> we've not got huge amounts about House Strong. Um, now, do you keep it relatively concise <laughs> but that with we know they're the lords of harren hall they got given this uh they are an old house um uh, and obviously at this point they're quite politically influential but why should we care about because after this basically hashtag spoilers book spoilers but after this basically they're gone um why should we okay you can come back to that why should why should we care about how strong so okay so there's a lot of good reasons to to care about how strong which i detail in numerous videos and streams actually i think you're on the how strong video aren't you I, I think i am yeah you are you do the voice for that one the um seeds of how strong well for one thing their their major role that's going to be in at least season one is they are going to more or less stand in for the starks they are very similar character wise they have a very they are um more they are sort of secret still old god worshipers despite being in the riverlands it's it's one of those things that's hinted at especially but it comes out with alice rivers especially um that there really is more of a connection there for them and so if you're the kind of person that's like oh man all the houses i don't like from game of thrones none of them are going to be important in house of the dragon well the strongs are really doing an impression just like the high towers are doing an impression of the tyrells um, so that kind of thing is should be exciting for you as a new fan. But the other reason is that a lot of the houses that we're used to are the ones that are already established, ones that are already powerful, ones that are pushing around their weight. And the Strongs themselves are the underdogs in the scenario. You say they got given Harrenhal, and they did, because nobody can hang on to Harrenhal, and it's a booby prize. Nobody wants it. It doesn't have the incomes. It doesn't have the lands and they were not powerful beforehand and they're not powerful now and they're trying to be and i did criticize auto hightower for doing this exact same thing but they they are a very ambitious house uh but they're also a very likable house or at least entertaining parts like laris i don't think is going to be likable i don't think that's going to happen for him <laughs> but uh the rest of them should be and they play a very important role in sort of being the the counterplay to the Targaryens and to the um, 
those that follow the faith of the seven. They're sort of this nor they're not northerners. Obviously, they're from the Riverlands, but they have sort of this old godish vibe to them, which we're going to see a lot more at the Blackwoods. So if that's the kind of thing you like, kind of a connection to maybe the more magical side, like um, there's definitely a sort of like Bran and Hodor thing to Lara Strong and Harwin Strong that George likes playing with. He always likes the the smart, smaller character with the larger um, kind of beefier sword swinging character. And there's a lot of that in there. And then also if you like characters like Brienne, there's definitely a theory that Brienne is a secret member of House Strong along with Duncan the Tall. So these are the kind of people that they play with. And I think those are very good things to look forward to. They should be, at the very least, entertaining. Yes, definitely entertaining. And and just my brief defense of Laris Strong is my take is that there are not many actual heroes of the Dance of the Dragons because basically everybody just pummels each other until everyone sort of collapses at the end. Um, but... Uh, when you read Fire and Blood, you do start to see towards the end of it, two or three characters actually start to realize this. They look around and go, you know what? We could carry on fighting for years. And mm-hmm. even Craig and so we all love it when Craig and Stark come, comes down and uh, Arrow of the Wolf and Craig crosses and, it. Did you say Craig? And? But, sorry? Did you say Craig and, Robert? It's Cregan, Okay. Okay, Craig well, Stark. Craig and Stark comes oh. down um, <laughs> from the north, and uh, he he bosses it uh, with the arrow <laughs> of the wolf. But he yeah. wants to carry on the fight, and the the people who actually stop him from doing that, we get um, one of those is Laris Strong. Mm. We also uh, get Collis Valarion uh, and. Uh, Talon Lannister as well, who they just, at the very end, it's almost as if they sort of get together and say, we just have to stop this madness. And I don't know how they're going to show this, because we never see that Mm. in the books. It's never shown. It's just that you can read between the lines that these people, they they see what's happening, they quickly send off some uh, letters to people via by, by Raven Mail and say, quick, you have to surrender quickly or otherwise this war's going to carry on. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they see that there's a mad king happening, we need to get rid of him and try and sort stuff out there. So they just like, they're doing stuff to try and end this war. Right. And they could in this show, this is going to be right down at the very end of the show, but they could make those characters actually quite heroic because they are the people who are stopping all of this horrendous uh, warfare and bloodshed. And if so, then Larry Strong may come out as one of the few heroes of this. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's how they want to go with this, but that's um, that's certainly a reading, one reading that I'm very sympathetic to with, sure. with uh, Fire and Blood. There's also um, a very good element to him that probably will be missing from Varys and Littlefinger is that he's going to sort of feel like the king of the ashes at the end of it. Like his family's gone. Everybody, like everyone left at Hall. the rest of the Strongs basically all get murdered by the end of it. Spoiler alert. And there could be a lot of good reflection for him on like, where did he, what did he do with his life? Like what have all of his choices led up to if this is what he has left, that kind of thing. And also, I forgot one other thing. I always forget things. Uh, the other reason to like how strong is that Rhaenyra's children are all strongs. So they're probably going to be uh, very likable characters. They're going to be very much like Harwin. And they're going to be very Stark-like. And I think that's going to throw a lot of people. They're going to be like, wait, these are Targaryens? It's like, well, they, they have a, they sort of a rough and tumble nature to them that's going to be very endearing compared to... They're, they're very people endearing people stabbing people's eyes out. against the court politics. <laughs> Yeah, they're not good at it. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Uh, Lady Pushkins, thank you very much uh, for the donation. Uh, just to remind you, if you've just come in, this is a charity stream in aid of uh, Alzheimer's um, research care support. Um, it, this is a horrible disease. So if you yeah. if you can afford to, uh, then please do be generous. Uh, Tara W, thank you uh, also for your uh, donation. Um, uh, Untroubled Waters just saying, I'm late. Hi, Matt. Good to see you uh, on In Deep Geek. Yeah, it has been a while since Matt has been on here, but uh, sure. it's great to have you uh, back. Better late. Um, yeah, so just before we move on from the Strongs, the seed, a lot of people in the chat, Carl Karsnark saying, the seed is strong. Do you think, uh, this is your full tinfoil hat moment, uh, do you think 
that the seed is strong is in any way a reference to how strong. Hang on a second. Let's 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 see if I can do this correctly. Oh, I see it. <laughs> um, I don't think it's a reference to how strong because it's a reference to that that um, Robert Aaron might be Littlefinger's child instead of Robert's. But I think there definitely is an idea that George likes playing with. Um, he introduced that once, but then he loves using the idea of characters who are being who are strongs being named something else or characters who are not strongs um pretending to be so like the the most glaring one is where i think we're going to talk about um gregor clegane he gets disguised as robert strong and that's that's sort of the narrative for them after they disappear it's that they're not gone that sort of like they sort of have roots throughout all of westeros and they continue despite that and i don't think that was intended at first because it's clearly just the thing about uh genetics but i think he's made it a thing later yeah i i think i would agree with that um miscellaneous ab thank you very much for the uh donation 444 of one of my patrons uh it's not really a question so much as a uh just sort of um, a, a comment. Uh, I must admit that I have great expectations for House of the Dragon. Stopped watching the original Game of Thrones show after the fifth season. Mm. Um, uh, as I'm watching right now the final season of Better Call Saul, I hope that House of the Dragon will be what Better Call Saul is for Breaking Bad, prequel that is um, as, as good as the original series and on many occasions even better. I have to admit I've not I mean I think I've seen a couple of episodes of Better Call Saul but I'm not slightly uh, up to speed with it um did, have you watched better call Saul? i watched the first three seasons and i've seen it in random clips and stuff on youtube while i was binging stuff yeah i i hear that the uh the ending was excellent though <laughs> um so um, i entirely understand and, and i think this is uh this is for me the better example of what i think hbo are trying to do here and i, I said this last time in my last live stream i think they are viewing this as their mandalorian where mm. they've, they've got this big success and then they're just trying to create something that everybody loves that they can then launch off of this is their central new thing they've thrown so much money at this sure. um it's seriously a lot of money and it gets kind of dwarfed by the rings of power thing and everyone's talking about that's the biggest budget uh tv show of all time but this is, I, th I think, per episode, bigger than twice the size of the original budget of Game of Thrones, and 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 somewhere along the line of the last season, but more episodes. This is more this per episode is, than season eight. Yeah, it's this huge, and they paid, I think it was about fifty million dollars just to get the rights to do all of this in the first place. So there's a lot of money in this, mm -hmm. and from this, I imagine that they will be wanting. We know they've got nine different yeah. uh, spin-offs in so on the go at the moment. They will announce some off of the back of this, I'm absolutely sure. But they're waiting to see how big a hit this is before deciding uh, how many and what and when. Although it's not really what Better Call Saul is because they're not, they didn't do that series to restart Breaking Bad. Vince Gilligan has said he's basically done with it after that in El Camino. Whereas this is a, like you said, this is very much they're trying to start a franchise. And Casey Bloys has talked about this. Uh, the president of HBO, where he he's been like he's been asked quite often like why are you putting so much money into Game of Thrones? Nobody talks about it anymore. Why is Game of Thrones dead? Why do you care? And he comes back and says that we make an unbelievable amount of money from people rewatching it on HBO Max from still buying merch. So their belief is that there is still a big audience out there if they can just find a way to get people to buy back in. And I think that's what they're trying to do here. I mean one of the bigger criticisms of season eight is their handling of the Targaryens. And now they're going to have an entire show about them. And with a particular character in Rhaenyra who mirrors Daenerys in very strong ways. So it's going to be sort of a, a second bite at the apple, so to speak, to hopefully get people back on board. Yeah. And, and it is very much, they've gone for the easy win. This yeah. is Targaryens. This is dragons. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there are a couple of new houses, but you will recognize the names of most of the other. There's House Baratheon are there, the Stark are there, like Winterfell. The and... Towers are the same thing. Exactly, and there's there's lots of lots of things that you will recognize. You you will see King's Landing. Uh, there are a couple of little changes, but mostly you understand it. So this is an easy win for them, and they clearly hired some 
excellent actors for it as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this they're, they're looking at this um, it, almost as a banker. They, 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 how can they possibly fail with it? And I, I don't think they will fail with this. Oh, they, they hope. They have a lot of money riding on this. This better be good. Uh, well, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to my, my only thing that I said. I enjoyed it. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing that I, I will happily say from, uh, from when I uh, saw this a little bit earlier today. I did really enjoy this. Um, uh, Deborah Lynch, thank you very much. Chelsea Prater, thank you very much uh, for uh, the donations. Benny Boy also... Um, just uh, just having a quick flick through the chat, see if there's any um, questions. Lord Corliss Whitefire saying, my hype for Amund One-Eye is way up now that I know he's being played by the same guy who played Osferth in The Last Kingdom. Uh, I've not really got that far in The Last Kingdom. Nope. Um, uh, I'm excited because Matt Smith was on Doctor Who and I love Doctor Who. Well, you you and me both. I'm yeah. a massive fan of Doctor Who. So, um, and and I think um, uh, when they cast him, there there was some concern. I have to say, out out in the fandom, it's like, oh, really? But he <laughs> he can carry off uh, that as well as being sort of charismatic and quirky and things like that that we know he can do. He has got that kind of depth of 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 anger that he can bring out into a performance as well which is what uh damon should have so i'm i'm very excited about it. and the other the other um casting to draw your attention to is paddy considine which oh, yeah. is the one that um george R. R. martin has singled out as being the performance that he liked the most in as much as he felt that Paddy Considine it was the writing and the the acting brought out an an extra element of Viserys uh, that wasn't there in his his writing which I wasn't expecting because I know him from Hot Fuzz so I was like the detective <laughs> that's gonna be Viserys okay and apparently it worked out really good that um his comedic chops make him really good at uh being King Viserys, I guess. And there's also the thing about Matt Smith when he was playing the Doctor that they did have him play episodes where he was a bad guy or he was acting evil or he was very much not being the um, the, ju the jester kind of character. Like, what he call himself? Space Gandalf? There were times when he was more um, more vicious and stuff like that, and those were good episodes. So I'm guessing that was part of what got him in there. But I know that's not what everyone thinks about when they think of that Doctor. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, he's he's a good actor. Let's uh, let's just uh, leave it with that. I think um, Paddy Considine has done a lot more than just uh, oh, yeah. just it, 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 it has to be said. Uh, uh, and the thing which immediately made me think he would be good, he he always has this um, uh, this feeling of vulnerability, a strength and vulnerability together, which is an incredibly rare kind of combination for for an actor. Is that you think that this okay. is he, the, as as a person, you can see that he's just like you could really scratch him and you would he would bleed. But at the same time, there's some kind of strength. It's really hard to put your finger on. But uh, as an actor, he is um, absolutely uh, outstanding. I would personally I say that most, most castings. I don't know a lot of actors. So I'm like, all right, let's see what they got. Um, so let's move on to uh, something I sort of teased earlier on in the, the live stream. Um, and we'll use a question from Mara Lee. Hi there, Mara, if you are watching, um, saying, I asked a similar question on Joe's last live stream and got his take on prophecy and dragon dreams, but wondered, Robert, your take. It was a dream slash prophecy regarding the doom of Valyria that encouraged Aegon and his sisters to leave Valyria and eventually conquer all of Westeros. Did any members of the house have any dreams or prophetic visions that could have eventually prevented a lot of the internal wars and eventual fall of the house? Um, so I'll use that as a starting point here, and I'll come to you in a moment, Matt, for you to sort of explain what it was you were saying there, but also I know that you've done quite a few, uh, I say quite a few, you've done a couple of videos recently, and I think you've spoken about this for quite some time. Yeah. The, the role of dragon dreams. Now, this is something which um, has 
the starting point for a lot of people coming to this was, uh, and I don't know whether this is where you where you come at this from, when Fire and Blood was launched, the book, uh, George R. R. Martin did a few little promo clips, and mm -hmm. he did one of them when he said, uh, some people have speculated that Aegon yes. the Conqueror invaded Westeros because he had a vision that needed it needed to be united and protected against the, uh, the White Walkers, the others, um, and you get with well, then we got the book and everyone got excited and you get the book and you read it and say that's not in here at all george what on earth are you talking about there's there's nothing here and it did seem as if he was just like he was just saying yeah some people have speculated that that doesn't mean that i'm writing it but some people have speculated that um but clearly dreams visions prophecies do play a role in the targaryen history we've got danis the dreamer as mara said this is the person who had a vision of the Doom of Valyria, and that's what rescued the Targaryens and brought them out in the first place. And then we do get various other characters that we know do get dragon dreams sure. um, dotted throughout the history uh, of, uh, of the Targaryens. But this idea that they invaded in the first place because they invaded Westeros in the first place because of some kind of dream or vision. What's your take on that? Oof. Well, it's it's a. I did go back and I watched those clips, and um, I think the general consensus when those things came out is that George was sort of repeating something that was in the World of Ice and Fire. It's it's presented in there too. There's a line about how oh, there's speculation that Aegon and the Targaryens came to Westeros because of a prophecy of the doom coming out of the West or something like that. But it's the same kind of. Um, what's the what's the right way of saying it? it's the uncertain way he said it where he's like well there are rumors rather than him just saying it so um and i can attest that for quite a long i've been making a lot of videos about this for a long time and it is really hard to get the fandom to, to um really take the impact of prophecy and dragon dreams seriously there's a lot of skepticism about it and even actually after george just said it the other day he just said it in an interview that that's why Aegon conquered westeros like, I'm a Reddit moderator, too. And let me tell you, people weren't happy. <laughs> they were like, mm. what is George doing? This is a retcon. He didn't mean it and all this other kind of stuff. So it, it's a, it's one of those things that there's a lot of people that are not going to be happy with the consequences of it. I go into that in a video I released the other day, which is currently called Why the Targaryens Conquered Westeros. But um, the way I put it succinctly is that when you think about the Targaryens, a lot of people think about them and their dragons and their relationship to them being the most important and the most signature part of the house, that they have these things, that they're one and the same. Matt Smith and um, Eve Best have talked about that a lot in interviews, that they are inseparable. But the, the dragons, actually to quote Matt Smith, he said in one of the things that, uh, one of the teasers, dreams didn't make us king, dragons did. And he's not wrong. It's correct. Mm -hmm. They are kings because they had dragons. But the mm -hmm. the dragon dreams themselves and the gift of prophecy for them really is their compass. It tells them where to go. And they have to follow it because when you look back at the example of Danis the Dreamer, the only reason they're alive, the only reason they're not there's not 40 out of 40, 40 families dead in the freehold is because of Danis. So it's a real lesson to the rest of the family all throughout history that they have to listen to these things because it's they were chosen that's the only reason they're still alive and that's going to be sort of underlying a lot of the characters that we're going to see in house of the dragon because it seems to be very frequent that they actually do get them but the um the main problem and i think the thing that george loves doing with the dragon dreams is that he loves to make them uncertain he nobody knows what they mean danis is the only one that predicted it correctly that was like she saw whatever she saw and she's like okay we have to get out of valyria everyone else in the history of westeros has gotten them wrong even aegon the conqueror like the idea is that he conquered it to stop the white walkers but he thought it was coming you know now like soon mm -hmm. and he's like well i'm me visenya and rainies we're the three heads of the dragon we have the dragons we'll conquer westeros We'll take out the White Walkers. They're coming soon. 300 years later, they show up. So it's like, it's the same kind of thing. And it's going to be, to answer Morley's question about, is there anybody that could have stopped the dance? I'm guessing it's going to be Viserys. He, they, he spoke about a dream in one of the promos. 
and but it's uncertain what he saw he saw images he saw flashes he heard sounds and dragons roaring the problem is that he's probably going to get the correct warning and then get it wrong and do the things that create the dance thinking he's trying to avoid it that kind of thing yeah i think that's a it's an interesting take because this is typical george r martin is that people they they get the dream vision prophecy whatever it is and then they misinterpret it and it's Every the the misinterpretation that drives the action rather than the actual the truth or not of of yeah. the prophecy um uh quick uh thank you to belrog wings uh fitz chivalry snow a fantastic name uh and both of those are fantastic names actually belrog wings clearly do not exist fitz chivalry snow great shout out to um robin hobb there um and i think there was another donation uh, i can't see it at the moment uh oh yeah jewel elson thank you very much indeed and moderators i saw you were doing a fantastic job just killing a few spoilers there in the chat uh, if you are watching this live the moderators here i think are the the best in the world they do an absolutely fantastic job not just uh getting rid of any spoilers there but making sure that this remains a a safe space a happy space and an uplifting space for everyone who comes here so if you are watching this live uh please do just show a little bit of love for, for the moderators because they do do a fantastic job um let's return to this idea then of these these dreams um so my initial i i will be very open about this but if people want to go back how many years it is, four years now, they'll probably find my thoughts on the subject at the time when Fire and Blood came out, when George R. Martin was doing those little video clips. My concern at the time was that if this was Aegon's reason for conquering, which is that the, the White Walkers, the others were going to come, mm. why on earth didn't he then immediately go up to the wall and like make it higher put more night's watch there in fact why did he why did it take him i i can't remember there's um i think andrew k always tells me in the chat how many years it was before he even got as far as winterfell um uh, he he went north on his great tours um, as far as white harbor but it took him uh, over a decade before he even got as far as winterfell so if this was his reason then he didn't he didn't show it um by his actions afterwards but i think the the flip of this is that this does give a reason for why he in particular was so obsessed with getting dawn right into uh, the seven kingdoms because if he if his vision was you have to have a united westeros um the the amount of effort that they they kept on losing seriously dawn just slapped their face every <laughs> single time they came over that border yeah. for over a hundred years um and i i will have to have a look properly zoom in properly but i think i saw viserys one of the pictures of king viserys's crown that they've yeah, got yeah. for house of the dragon has got a dawnish symbol on it how arrogant which, how arrogant of which him. exactly which is that i mean there's there's confidence and there's putting the emblem of a country you've not yet conquered on your own crown, uh, that that level of confidence. It's yeah. um, it, clearly that makes a whole lot more sense if you think that your, your role in the universe is to unify the mm -hmm. entire continent. So I, I do get that. And this, what George R. R. Martin has said recently is basically drawing a thread through all of these instances that we have of Targaryens having dreams, uh, that we had Danis was bringing them out from um, uh, Valyria, Aegon got a dream which got them over to Westeros. Then, you know, you, much later we have this the prince that was promised prophecy, mm -hmm. which is talking about a specific line of Targaryens. In between that, we have various other. Um, uh, uh, dreamers within the Targaryens. Danny in the, the current story gets dragon dreams all the time. Right. And basically what George R. R. Martin's most recent comments have been, it's been drawing a line through all of that and saying, hey guys, this isn't just a whole load of accidental dreams. They are linked. Right. And that for me, if you pull all of this together, the key thing here, I'm going to do just a quick 
um, sort of a plug for a video which is going to come out a couple of days time probably I'm going to do a video setting out my thoughts on all of this kind of dream stuff sure. but I think the key thing because I always spoil my own videos the key thing is that this changes really, how really we view the Targaryens right. because they are uh, they are conquerors they come and say some yes I know we we see Daenerys and we're very sympathetic towards Daenerys. George R. R. Martin sets her up as very sympathetic. But the more you go through fire and blood, the more you hear them say things like, we're, we're almost like gods. Uh, we're, we're, we're different to all of you normal plebs. Um, <laughs> uh, we have this great divine right to be, uh, to be ruling this uh, land. This sure. kind of thing is incredibly arrogant and incredibly entitled. But the moment you say, okay, they actually have a reason for this, does it justify it? Perhaps, perhaps not, but it adds an extra layer in that you then have to start thinking about from a story element. Are the Targaryens just this conquering people because they want power or are they conquering because they want to do, they want to save humanity? It's it's an interesting question because I, it's one that George directly engages with with the rest of A Song of Ice and Fire. Because but the way you talked about it as like a, a string or something like that, that's exactly how I conceived of the... Actually, Crowfood's daughter, or Disputed Lands, me and her did a lot of stuff thinking about this, and that's where a lot of those videos came out from. But if you tug on the idea of dragon dreams in the Targaryen dynasty, everything makes sense. Every weird decision they've ever made, every weird character trait, it all comes down to these dreams. Like, what's what happened at Summerhall? Dragon dreams and prophecy. Why did Baylor the Blessed do all those weird things? Dragon dreams and prophecy. It all It all works that way. But in terms of the idea, this is one of those things that um, I, I saw some takes after George's comments were revealed and they were like, well, see, they were doing things for the right cause. They, they were trying to save the world, so they can't be that bad, right? And it's like, well, I don't know. What do you think about Stannis burning his nephew or his daughter to try and save the world? It's the same question. Just because it's a good cause doesn't mean everything is acceptable because you're going after it like you use the example of Aegon burning Dorne he burned it for like years he killed an unbelievable amount of people but he did it to maybe save the world and it's like oh it makes him more of a gray character I suppose but it's also like was that all necessary is it all necessary is he even getting it right and um what was the other example you talked about there was um Oh, why didn't he do all this thing, like go to the north, and why didn't he reinforce the watch? Why did he ignore it? Well, he kind of didn't, right? Because he left the north intact. He didn't kill a single northern soldier in his conquest. And not only that, at the time, the Night's Watch was fully manned. Every single castle had people in it. They had like 10, 15,000 swords on the watch. Didn't have to do anything. Ready to go. So in a sense, he made a second Night's Watch, probably by talking to Torrin Stark and saying, like, this is what I'm here for. I don't want to kill any Northerners because the White Walkers are coming. Winter is coming. We're both on the same page about this, right, Torn? And then basically agreed that when they showed up, the dragons were coming north to defeat them. I'm guessing that's the explanation of why he didn't do anything. He did do something. He didn't kill a lot of Northerners. Well, I mean, this is an interesting... Uh, I've not heard that idea that, that Torn Stark is now into it in, in, in this grand no, conspiracy grand as well. So... Right? Yeah, so for those who don't know, this is the king who kneeled. This is the the, the Starks came down. The Aegon and and his sisters and their dragons came, uh, and the Starks and the North came down to meet them, and then they saw the dragons and basically went, "Yeah, okay, well, we're not doing this." <laughs> and then, there, yeah, <laughs> they 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 it, it's a very sensible decision, um, uh, but uh, the idea that perhaps they sort of got together, they chatted, and, and he, Aegon the then said to him. Yeah, we you you know the the North remembers we we we've just discovered uh, the same thing uh, and now we're we're on your side. Um, Andrew K, I knew would come up with the the the, the facts. Um, uh, three decades apparently oh, it took yeah. his last progress to get uh, went to Winterfell and he never went to the wall. Um, so this is um, whereas I do, I do like that idea that he like he could say this is fine there's lots of people up there it's still it, it it never quite worked for me this idea that he didn't even look 
he was on the dragon and he, he could even he could have flown up there had a little look and gone okay this is fine or no it's not um so i think a lot of this for me this is where we get into the nerdy detail of it, what exactly is this that he's what is, is the driving force to unite the seven kingdoms against a uh, a, a force that he doesn't know exactly what it is or is it specifically about we have to watch out for the return of the others is it something else that that is the the element that i think is is still slightly missing and we have to say yes this comes from george r, r. martin whatever we get in house of the dragon does come from george r, r. martin we've had confirmation does that mean uh that that is exactly what is happening in the book world because um he's not yet fully explained his view on he says his role with the tv shows now is to try and keep them canon but does that mean that he thinks that this is gonna be this is the same as his his book world or is he thinking these are two separate things in the way that he saw game of thrones as being separate to to a song of ice and fire i don't think we've teased that out fully yet hey maybe in history of westeros uh i managed to to get that kind of thing out of right um um they uh for those who don't know uh friends of the channel aziz and Ashaya, uh had an interview with george r. r martin hour and a half um and uh i very briefly uh managed to was in contact with with aziz when he was on his way back home and he said he was going to immediately he's going to be editing it and trying to get it out as soon as possible so um i would highly recommend people uh, uh check that out uh, i assume it will be on both the podcast and on the youtube channel probably the ashaya was taking a lot of pictures did like a house tour above the front door is aria's dagger the the valyrian steel dagger that's the wow. that's what the, the front door on the way into george's house which is kind of he also had uh, i saw uh he had some stained glass of yeah. the different uh sort of sigils and shields and things like that so uh, yeah he is um, it sounds like he's got the kind of house that I would have if I was George R. R. Martin. So. Everything about it, I'm like, I want to live there, George. Yeah, <laughs> can I can I rent? Like, I'll live in the basement. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, will you adopt me, please? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think um, uh, just having a quick flick through the chat. Um, uh, Antoine Denison saying, if the Targaryens were world savers, why wouldn't they start with Valyria? They're world savers in as much as it preserves Targaryen power. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the sure, way I think this is set up is that they had the Danis had this vision to get them out from Valyria. Then they hung around on Dragonstone for a hundred years, and then they had another dream or vision. That seems to be what it is, rather than. They always, as a family, they always were about saving the world. I think. So I think this was a, a later thing. And the Valyrians laughed at them and told them they were idiots. So that's kind of on the Freehold's fault at that point. That's uh, that's fair. Let's go to um, some more questions from my patrons. Um, Emma Scheiman saying this is in response to an interview with the actors in which they were all asked which character they consider the most evil. I was surprised to hear many of them name Otto Hightower. Personally, I would think it would be Damon. I'm curious whether you would agree with the actors uh, based on your reading of Fire and Blood and what you would consider to be Otto's most evil act. Will he be more evil on the show than in the book or was he just evil in Fire and Blood? Um the more evil than I picked up. Um, so uh, what 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 do you reckon here? In terms of, I mean, I agree, Otto, he comes across as quite Machiavellian to me. Um, he, he's got more than a hint of Tywin to him, thinking that he can win, thing, win things sort of by negotiation and by writing letters places rather than warfare. Um, but um, I, I think... Evil is probably not the first word I would put there. I think a power grab is is more where I'm at. Uh, but what's your take? Would you call him evil? I would, because I think the thing that really cements him as evil is the Green Council. I mean, spoilers for what's going to happen during this season. Uh, Viserys is probably going to die, and we're probably going to see the Council where they decide what they're going to do with that information, because it happens while Rhaenyra is on Dragonstone. 
and it leads to the Dance of the Dragons. And even in Fire and Blood, when you read the interactions, they sort of go through a list of like, all right, so why are we doing this? Like, why are we, why are we going to usurp Rhaenyra? Why are we going to put somebody else on the throne? And they go through one of them, one by one, and none of them really stick. And the one that really does stick is Otto going like, well, Damon's going to kill all of us. And it's like, he is? Like, Damon could have done that for like 20 years. Why, why is he going to kill you now? And, and it's just the way that it's such a culmination of everything that he's been doing. Like you talked about earlier, he has been so deliberately trying to ingratiate his family into the Iron Throne. He clearly made Alicent uh, like the caretaker for Jaehaerys and then kept her around Viserys all this time. There's a possibility that he killed Emma Arryn. I mean, that's definitely a tinfoil theory, but it certainly does help him that she dies so that Viserys has to get a new wife. Um, also questionable what happens to Viserys' sons before Aegon is born. It's one of those things where there's really not a... The, the best thing you can say about Otto is that he's trying to preserve his family under the idea that Damon's going to murder them all, which is, I don't think, really supported anywhere that Damon has a bloodthirst for the High Towers. They don't like each other, but Damon not, has not really gone out and straight-up murdered political um political enemies in the past now he might once they plan to usurp Rhaenyra and that's definitely on the table but that's sort of an auto problem he's like I'm gonna get killed if I do what I want to do so we have to do it anyway it's like wh what are you talking about Otto what what kind of what kind of sense does that make it's it's just so clearly uh self-serving in a very greedy and I would say evil way but I don't think he's the most evil character in what we'll see in House of the Dragon. I think uh, Aemon One-Eye is probably going to wear that crown. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, he looks evil. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I, the, the promo shot we've we've had, or maybe it was a still from uh, one of the, the trailers when he's got, like, the hood up and the, the, the yeah. patch over one eye and they're just glaring. It's a, yeah, they, if that is how they're going to be setting him up, then, uh, yes, I think they may well be. I, I will put Kristen Cole up there. Um, personally, for for the the reason that whereas I th I think I I mean I don't like Otto Hightower as a character I don't think he's a good person but I think I'm probably slightly more sympathetic to him uh, than you are I think there is definitely an element of he thinks that Damon is mad bad dangerous to know and would be a bad king and I think that that is is fair and I think that he probably does think that he's protecting his family. That doesn't justify what he's doing, but I can understand it. Um, Kristen yes. Cole, I always get the impression that what he's doing is just out of sheer hatred. True. Um, uh, that that seems to be, and I will be fascinated. That this is a question that comes up almost every time I talk about Fire and Blood. Is it what exactly happened between Kristen Cole and Rhaenyra? Mm -hmm. And it's not we're not given the exact answer in fire and blood we're given a few different possibilities but what we do know is that he completely flipped onto the other side he was her greatest supporter something happened suddenly he's absolutely against her and you talk about the green council he's the one who as far as we can tell he 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 killed someone starting this Sorry. whole thing off uh, that you, we can have Otto Hightower can talk and talk and talk, but actually it required one person to spill the first blood, and that seems to have been Kristen Cole. Um, and so he, for me, is driven by hatred and vengeance, um, is my reading of his character. So I think he's the closest we get to um, a, a, a sort of a, a proper baddie. And I, I love the fact that they have cast somebody who, who clearly is a very handsome man um uh, which will will confuse all of us because you, you he, he looks like the perfect knight well they've, yet... had, they've had fabian frankel do some interviews and he's sort of portraying his idea of the character is that um Kristen cole is a country knight in over his head and he's being manipulated and he's being pushed around and that makes me think he's more of like a barristan character where like what if barristan really like got a bug up his butt or what he's going to, I guess what he's going to do in um, the winds of winter in, uh, in Marine and what he ends up doing with it. But I, I think the, that's the saving grace of Kristen is that he is not the puppet master and that 
he may he's he's going to do some very uncool things and some pretty evil things but i don't think i don't know it, it feels like he's being more manipulated into his position than he is legitimately a force for evil in the world it just so happens that he has an important job and i think that's again that's one of the things fabian frankel talked about is he's like well Kristen doesn't know what to do with any of the power he has he doesn't know what to do with the affection of a princess because he's just some country bumpkin knight who suddenly finds himself in the middle of an enormous political struggle so mm -hmm. is this the same as you wanted to forgive otto a little bit i'm going to forgive <laughs> Kristen a little bit Kristen's kind of a dumbass, and he doesn't know what's going on. I mean, I, I get yeah, he's. I, I will sign up to the fact that he's a dumbass um, yeah. uh, in your delightful American way. Um, uh, I th but uh, I, I think I think he does know what he's doing. Um, oh. Is is my okay. my take on that one? I I think that he's just uh, just too boiling over with 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 anger and rage and probably a few uh, a few other bad uh, things let's get to a question from um zvibo and this is another question which comes up quite regularly on my stream so I'd, I'd be fascinated to know your take on it uh hi robert with so many dragons around in westeros at this time do you think anyone ever tried to skin change into one of them is that even possible um now I, I always hedge my way around answering this one um, because I think it, it started, the questions always start with uh, Bran. They don't always start, but they often come around to, is Bran going to skin change into a dragon because of the, you, you know, you, you, you won't walk again, but you will fly uh, line. And my take on that is no, I don't think he will. Um, but uh the theoretical possibility of skin changing into a dragon is something that I don't think we've yet got enough information on to make a, a full judgment on, um, which is, is never a satisfactory answer. Um, they, you can skin change if you're powerful enough, uh, then you can skin change into animals and you can skin change into humans. We know that Bran has done those things. So is there a reason why you shouldn't skin change into a dragon? There's no reason why you shouldn't in theory, and yet it feels wrong. Sure. Um, so that's where I always come down to, which isn't a satisfactory answer. So I would love you to, to give me that satisfactory answer that I can go with from now okay. on. All right, I got this. So uh, during your last stream, this actually came up. You read one of my one of my comments in the chat where somebody was asking about magical systems, and my answer to explaining George is either it's number one, it's psychic powers, or two, don't think that hard, too hard about it because he clearly didn't. That's usually his answer. Like he literally <laughs> says, "I don't have systems; I have effects. I like things to happen, so I make them happen," and that that's that's one of the things that makes it hard to really dig down into his magical systems like in terms of skin changing and warging and dragon dreams and green sight and all this other stuff. But the, I know in the past, George has been asked about is the relationship between a skin changer and their animal, the same as a dragon and a dragon rider. And he has said, no, he said they are different, but they are similar. So, um, this is one of those things, but they, this is something that's going to come up in House of the Dragon that Matt Smith and Eve Best have talked, I said this earlier, have talked a lot about how they feel that their characters are linked with their dragons, that Craxes is Damon, that Rhaenys is Maelys. They're one and the same. They share a soul. So I think it's going to, I, I am not sure if a regular skin changer could, you know, go into a dragon, but it seems like maybe the Targaryens or dragon riders can do something similar actually someone brought up uh, something interesting during my stream yesterday uh aegon the the sixth and senrixian were talking about this uh, if a dragon rider dies do they have a second life in the dragon do they go into it in hmm. the same way that we know that happens with john and um and rob when they die they both go into their wolves well we think john does but we're pretty sure and we know rob did with Greywind. so I'm not sure if anybody could skin change a dragon rider. I mean, if any, <laughs> ooh, I don't want to think about human skin changing, but I don't, I don't know if any skin changer could uh, take control of a dragon, but maybe the dragon riders can on some level. But Bran breaks so many rules as a character. Every rule that is presented to Bran, he breaks. So 
I have no idea if he actually could in the end game of the story. Maybe. Because that's what George does with them. He uses them to shatter walls. Um, yeah, he he does. I mean, I... This I really um, ever say for sure, because often he hasn't made up his own mind himself. Yeah. <laughs> um, one... One thought which did come up, I wish I could remember who it was so I could give them credit. It was in my, I think it was in my last live stream or perhaps the one before. Somebody came up with the question or the idea that um, the bond between dragon and rider was not just one way. It wasn't just that the the dragon, that the rider could sort of like put thoughts into the mind of the or influence what the dragon's doing but the dragon can put it back the other way we just haven't seen that because with danny's dragons obviously they've they've just grown up from being hatchlings but what if you've got a dragon like say Valerion, mm. who has got this whole range of history going all the way back to valeria what if that dragon bond meant that you got some of that kind of memory or something and who was the last person to ride Valerion? viserys Oh, I was going to say, um, but yeah, before that. Yeah, but he did not ride another dragon afterwards. Right. So is this because he doesn't want to bond with another dragon to kind of wash out whatever it was that he's he's got as this kind of memory from Beleriand, which I found as a fascinating idea. Um, I don't think we've got any evidence of that yet, but... It's the kind of thing they have, the showrunners have talked at quite a lot of length about, and, and as you say, the, the actors as well, about this bond between Dragon and Rider, which we should see playing out because there is knowledge of this. And that, I think, is the, the key difference. Danny's making it up as she goes along. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know how to even control her dragon. She gets on a dragon, flies, and at the first time, it just carries on flying in the wrong direction. Yeah. <laughs> she can't do a thing about it. Um, uh, she just goes, hey, I'm sure the ancient Valyrians used to have some like horns that they could blow to control dragon. She doesn't know what's going on. But here, we have got this whole bank of knowledge. We know they have saddles. They have... Uh, dragon uh, tamers, effectively, people who are there operating within the dragon pit. Um, they've got a whole history of this. They've got this, you put a dragon egg in the, uh, in the, the, sort of the cot for the, the baby. Um, there's a lot of knowledge, and we should see that knowledge coming out in this show. Um, and it's a good sign that they've, they've been thinking about this. And the one example that is my favorite that shows there is definite connection, if you go back and read The House of the Undying Visions, so Danny drinks the House of the Undying and she starts tripping. She starts seeing things like her third eye opens or whatever. But Drogon does too. Drogon mm. didn't drink any, but he like can't fly. He's bouncing into things. He's hissing at the visions that Danny is seeing, which tells you that even though Danny is high on hallucinogens, somehow Drogon is too, which is a very uh, direct way of saying, yes, they are very, very closely connected in a way that I don't think most people give them credit for. Uh, yes, and there's there are a couple of throwaway lines in Fire and Blood as well. Like, for example, uh, when uh, when the Greens and the Blacks before we get to war, but when they're clearly antagonistic towards each other, then there's this throwaway line about and people noticed that uh, when the dragons of the two sides happened to be near each other, they started sort of snapping and snarling at each other, which was clearly they'd taken on the antipathies that were there from their riders. Uh, so. There is a link that hopefully we will see a lot, uh, a lot more exploration of. Yeah. Um, oh, reflective ramblings in the chat. Uh, uh, hi, great, great to see you could make it as well. Um, the second half of that question, though, was was an intriguing one. Um, Svebo also asked, uh, "Are there any actors from Game of Thrones you would like to see return in a different role?" Mm. Personally, I'd love to see Sean Bean play, uh, make a return playing Cregan Stark, as I believe Matt insists we say. Um, are there any um, any others? I mean, for me, I'll come to you in a moment, uh, Matt. For me, I think the short answer is no, I don't want any uh, actors returning. I, I want a completely new set of actors. Um, but reading the question, just this mischievous thought came into my head, was how much fun would it be if someone like say Carice Van Houten, who was Melisandre, randomly appeared uh, yeah. playing someone like 
Alice Rivers. That would be, and they they gave no explanation for it. That would that would absolutely blow everyone's minds. Um, I, I'm sure they won't do that, but that would be a, a, a fantastic little just sort of like nod to to fan theories. Oh, people would lose their minds. People already think already theorized that Alice Rivers is Melisandre because Melisandre is like 300 years old apparently so has she is she also like Jenny of Old Stones and is she also Alice Rivers and all this other crazy stuff uh that would not be out of the that's not out of the tinfoil realm of the Song of Ice and Fire <laughs> the character um that I think people would hate the most but I would find the funniest just because like the fan would burn down is if Bran makes an appearance if he comes back yeah and like he's they see him in the future or somebody sees him in a vision or something like that. That'd be kind of funny. Um, I think there's a lot of chance for there. I don't know if they're going to do this, but there's a definite possibility. There's going to be another three eyed crow figure in the show They're They've been talking a lot about how they're introducing more magic and prophecy and all that stuff has to do with the weirwoods and the children, and especially with Adam Valarion eventually going to the Isle of Faces. It would be, intriguing if they brought somebody back to play that character not necessarily uh isaac hampstead right but if another character another person from the show mm. just for fun and put them in a lot of makeup that'd be kind of cool yeah i i think i would i would love uh, just some sort of little nod to some sort of uh fan theory or um something like that would that would work really well for me if 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 you get a character who survived for a really long time uh just maybe just in the crowd somewhere um that i would i would love it um oh he could see, be alive he could definitely be alive he could could see sophia s thank you very much uh for the donation uh thank you by the way th there have been a lot of anonymous donations as well thank you very much uh, i know not everyone wants their uh name read out david craig thank you uh it's very generous uh david uh thank you uh very much for that um and um i think that's me caught up in the chat uh mid morning throners saying i can't wait to see the fight between the cargill twins mm -hmm. Uh, Sansa thinks of it uh, five times in the main series and always romanticizes it. So I know the real thing will be super brutal. Yeah, I um, I have a feeling that's a season two thing, probably. Um, season one is the build up to the Dance of the Dragons. Um, mm. And I think, and we've got a question on them one where they're going to end it in a moment. So we won't go down far too far down that route but i uh, it will be roughly up until the outbreak of hostilities um right. so that is uh where we're going up to I, I think in season one let's go to a question from uh oh actually did, i said we've got a question on it let's let's do it now george rr tolkien do you think they will end the season with blood and cheese no um uh, at that point, they could end it with the Damon quote, an eye for an eye, a sun for a sun, and the beginning of the dance. So uh, so let's get into it. Matt, Matt, where where would you like them to end it, or where do you think they will end it? So George has said in an interview that the show is going to go, season one is going to go from 101 AC to 129. 129 is the year of Viserys dies. So it's clearly going to be focused around that. The way that... Um, they uh, people who have seen the six screeners have said that they switched to old Rhaenyra or older Rhaenyra Emma Darcy around uh, Darcy. Actually, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Darcy, Darcy. I'm not sure. Uh, around season six, around episode six or seven. So there's not a lot of time there. Um, clearly, they're going to do a halfway time skip. So I don't think we're going to get blood and cheese. I think that's going to be something they're going to say for season two, their own little red wedding kind of thing, because everybody in the world's going to make a reaction video to it the same way they did to the red wedding. That was actually one of the things that got Game of Thrones off the ground, the internet um, reacting to the horribleness of the, the red wedding. It really took it to another level of popularity where I think they'll end it is Viserys is going to die. Obviously, we're probably going to see the Green Council, and then we'll see um, the Strong Boys, Jace, um, Luke, and Joffrey, or at least I think it's just Jace and Luke, go off to try and get um, support for Rhaenyra. Because there's a particular moment there that is really the point at which there's no coming back, and it's the uh, Luke and Aemond. That's the one where I go back and I read back, and I'm like, 
they could have turned it around. There could have been some sort of deal made. They could have gone to politics. They could have figured this out after Luke dies and the way he dies, there's really no coming back. There's too much on this, on the line at that point. So I'm pretty sure that's where they're going to end it. And then they'll save blood and cheese for again, for season two. Yeah. I don't think I, I would disagree that I think that there are a few places they could end it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, if they're taking it up to the the outbreak of hostilities or the point of no return, uh, that there you could you could say they could end it with Viserys's death. I think they'll take it a little bit further than that. Yeah. You could theoretically end it with the the Green Council the moment that they decide that's it, we're doing this because the viewer will go, ha ha, now it's going to be war. They could take it to the moment where the blacks hear this uh there's a whole load of uh because rhaenyra is giving birth at the time um and it's actually quite uh um what are we going to do how do we react there there are a lot of in the trailers there are a lot of pictures of of damon and rhaenyra sort of staring moodily out over the water presumably towards king's landing i i, I don't know whether they exactly yeah you you're a picture you're like matt smith um it's uh i don't know whether that's exactly how they would it would end it but that's the kind of feel i i think we're going for is that they yeah. go right that's it we're now going for war as you say the sort of the the, the battle over shipbreaker bay with the the the, the Aymond and um uh luke that battle there the that dragon. is sorry dragon battle which makes it even yeah more... it's a dragon battle mm-hmm. after that the moment that somebody actually dies uh somebody that they care about not lord beesbury um <laughs> okay. the, who who incidentally again d- this is a pure like i just happen to know this actor i'm sure he's going to absolutely nail it it's not a big role but he's uh he's a guy and i've forgotten the guy's name but if you've ever seen uh fleabag it's fleabag's dad um who's got this uh he's just you can't help but think oh you lovable lovable old man um and uh who's yeah i think he'll absolutely nail that role um for how short a period of time he has it for but um i think that that once you get a death Mm-hmm. Then that's the moment that we get there. They could take it up to blood and cheese because that's blood and cheese is basically the it's the a reaction, the revenge, the other side of that. Um, if they don't, then they'll have to almost open with blood and cheese in season which two, which which would be quite a way to open the season two. Is like bang straight here we go, we're back. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, somewhere around there, it's it's the moment that there is no way back now we have to have a war there's also a sense uh if you go back and watch the way game of thrones was usually structured season wise where they decided to end it they never they never ended on the high point they always ended on the the immediate reaction to it like the the best episode of the season was always the second to last one so i imagine council and all that stuff will be episode nine and then ten we're gonna see um Luke and Aemon, and, and then the war is really on. And then, like you said, we'll probably see the scene of Damon and Rhaenyra just like looking out across the ocean, like we're gonna kill them all with fire and blood or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that I think that that worked. I mean, I, I love the way that you think a dragon battle is the the less exciting bit. Um, you think that uh, yeah, seven or eight people sitting around a, a table the discussing stuff is that this is the big highlight in the penultimate episode and then oh well, well I suppose we have to squeeze in a dragon battle in the last episode uh, but uh yeah that the book fans are all about the green council <laughs> um they are and this is also one of the few bits where we get lots of original george R. R. martin dialogue um a lot of the way through this we will not this is original stuff written by the showrunners the writers um but there in the green council um and also i think when aemond turns up at storm's end we get a lot of actual dialogue from george r R. martin which i'm hoping they keep as much of that in as they possibly can it's some of the only dialogue in that part of the book after i remember it's all outlined until then yes yeah it is pretty much um uh that's i think that's me 
with my patrons questions about the show itself so i've got i've got a few sort of slightly slightly wider questions uh, about sort of game of thrones and song of ice and fire but mm -hmm. guys if you want to drop any more questions into the chat about um uh, house of the dragon then now is probably a good time to uh, to do that um uh, Sam Rexian, thank you very much for the uh, for the donation hugely appreciate that um let's Let's do a, one of these slightly wider questions. Creative Branches saying, hey, Robert, um, I had to reset my passwords and got kicked out of my HBO account for a, for a minute. My marketing brain was gifted data. HBO apparently is temporarily allowing five Game of Thrones episodes to be streamed for free by people without an account. Um, can you and uh, Matt guess why they chose these five and... Yeah, would we have also chosen these uh, five? Now, I did. Uh, I think Matt, I did uh, send that across to you before, so you have had a chance to to see these. I'd be intrigued by your uh, react. Well, everyone's reaction. So, the, the five that apparently HBO are letting people see for free are season one, episode one, so the the opener. Uh, season one, episode two, ten, so the end of the first season. Then all the way up. Nothing until season six, episode nine, the Battle of the Bastards, the start, opener of season seven, Dragonstone, and then the final episode uh, of season eight. Now, I mean, I can, I can probably explain some of these, which is okay if you're going to give people five, then the first episode and the last episode. Yes, that makes sense. The Battle of the Bastards, I think, is generally. If you asked people to list their top five episodes, most people would probably put it in their top five episodes. So I can certainly uh, see that. Why? Why do you think that these other two are in there? Um, and what would you choose? What would you choose as like Ooh, five well, random episodes? If you look at the list, um, season one, episode ten, Fire and Blood, is Danny birthing the dragons or hatching the dragons. Wrong word. Yeah. Hatching. She did not birth them. That would be. <laughs> quite painful um so that one makes a lot of sense for in terms of trying to get to the magic of the targaryens the feeling of destiny and the dragon dream nature of it to it because that's one of the things the show kind of pushed down about danny is how much she interacts with the magic and prophetic world and though that episode is where a lot of it happens like she sees the dragons coming in her dreams she has that crazy dream where she's running up a hallway with a whole bunch of kings with fiery swords and stuff like that so that's a that's a pretty good one for trying to poke at the Viserys and Rhaenyra stuff that they're that they've been talking about a lot in the promos. Uh, Battle of the Bastards makes perfect sense. There's there's gonna be battles in this season, but it's gonna be just at the Stepstones basically. So I mean, it's gonna be a spectacle. Damon's gonna kill an absurd amount of people, but um, it is one of the things that people think about Game of Thrones the most: how great their battles are. Uh, let's see here. The Dragonstone episode. That's Danny landing on Dragonstone, right? That's the season yeah. one. I mean, season seven, episode one. Again, that gets to the more reminding people of Danny and the feeling of um, feeling of legacy for the Targaryens, and that she's stepping into this fallen empire kind of thing. They're going to show us the empire as it was. Cut, makes a lot of sense. The Iron Throne one is funny because I don't. I don't think people are going to appreciate being able to watch that one for free. I do. I like I liked season eight, but uh, I understand that that is not what people... It's like, which five episodes can I watch? Oh, the one I hate the most? Thanks. Thanks for that one. And uh, the season one, episode one, winner is coming. I think that one's the classic one. But I think it's especially good because it's the calm before the storm episode. It's like the last time things were okay in Westeros before everything falls to shit. But it's also, um, I said this earlier, and this is something I think they're definitely hinting at. It is one of those episodes that has a real feeling of the old gods and the children of the forest and like that they may have pushed things along the way, especially with the finding of the dire wolves, the death of the, the direwolf mother with the stag and how john finds it he hears ghosts but nobody else does that kind of stuff this is a lot of magical episodes they've picked a lot of stuff that has a lot to do with prophecy the old gods and dragon dreams yeah i mean i think that as a uh, as a reasoning behind that i think i think that's absolutely right i i decided when i was looking at this 
I actually think they should just do episodes one to five of season one. Yeah. Um, because if 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 you want an introduction to it, that's that's that that's as good as Game of Thrones got. I mean, there there were random episodes in later seasons that were astounding, but as a long run, I personally think the first two or three seasons are, are as, as good as you can get. And that that opening, um, when we're just learning about these characters, when we discover Tyrion bursting onto the scene, coming out with all these little quips and 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 things, and and uh, who's that really annoying Jamie guy, and 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 just having i mean we got we got sean bean being being ned stark alive and well um happy days um but the breaking news i'm going to move us away from that discussion because this is breaking for me um and this is going to be something which uh will make a lot of people very happy um i don't know whether anyone else has heard it maybe i'm just behind the times carl Karsnark saying ryan condor has said that there will be some mushroom Easter egg in the show. Okay. Uh, so there we go. I that's the first I've heard of any mention that mushroom is actually going to be in the show. Have you heard this? He's not really in it though. Like even in Fire and Blood, he's this sort of on the periphery. It's like patch face or something. No, I think I think you clearly misunderstood the importance of Mushroom's role. Every, every time you read, he's telling us quite how central he is to all of this. He's a, the most important character. I for, I'm sorry, I forgot. He was in all the war councils. He was riding a dragon, everything. It was one of those things where I was just like, well, they're not going to give him a big role because he doesn't have one in Fire and Blood. He's just the fly on the wall that everyone ignores. So... Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, I agree with you. Is that he? He clearly is not that important uh, as an as a sort of a narrator and a source. Yes, but um, I, the the fact that they are including him somewhere, I think somehow is good because he was there, and uh, I th I think every one of you will be very disappointed if he didn't get any kind of uh, shout out. I asked my uh, my subscribers for burning questions they had about. Uh, house of the dragon and like mushroom came up three or four times like more than anything i was like oh, okay <laughs> i guess that makes sense uh he's gonna be an interesting character like because the the tone that they've set for this season is no fun allowed everything's serious everything's high drama or it's uh well actually no they're gonna do something different with young rhaenyra and young allison but everything else is gonna be like late season game of thrones where literally no fun allowed and it'd be kind of almost take you out of it a little bit of all of a sudden like just a fool does a cartwheel across the floor and starts cracking jokes as Damon's talking about how he's gonna murder pirates or something yeah that that is one thing that i mean i, I wouldn't call it a concern for uh, yes. house of the dragon but it's just um <laughs> certainly in in the earlier seasons of game of thrones you would have funny moments yeah. and that there isn't much fun in a, a, a civilization heading towards civil war, um, and uh, most of the sort of set pieces are really quite gruesome. So, and we don't have like a Tyrion-like character who who just sort of wanders through, just uh, throwing jokes out here and there. So, yeah, I, I, this will be darker than Game of Thrones. Uh, there's not much doubt about that. I don't think it would be amazing if like Rhaenyra gets the news like Luke is dead. She's like, oh no, mushroom. Tell me a joke or something. Like <laughs> uh, Emma Scheinman saying Mushroom will be the Tom Bombadil of House of the Dragon. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm not. I, I I I love the idea that he can be as unaffected by the Iron Throne as the Tom Bombadil <laughs> is by the the One Ring. Um, and oh, quick question, Robert: Is yeah. Tom Bombadil Eru Luvatar? No. No. Whoa. Okay. All right. Um, well, this is uh, uh, actually digression. I, I know this is a House of the Dragon stream. This is something that I, on all of my, whenever I have a guest on one of my uh, Lord of the Rings live streams, I always ask them just as a as a closing question, who who or what is Tom Bombadil? And literally everyone has a different answer. Um, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. The 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 way that 
Tom Bombadil has many huge fans and many critics, but there's no doubt Tolkien created a complete enigma that people are debating to this day. Uh, my take at a very high level is that he is an echo of the music of the Ainur um, and an expression of Middle Earth. He was there at the beginning and he will survive until the end. And that is, he is uh, Tolkien showing us about being and existing and the joy of life rather than doing stuff but not god but not not god no. interesting interesting um let's go back to a song of ice and fire we've got a couple of questions about a song of ice and fire my favorite uh tinfoil theory uh character morally not morally she's not a tinfoil theory character but she's asking about blood raven um, we know that Blood Raven had dreams and visions. He was a green seer. Do you think all the things Blood Raven did for his house he thought was for its good and the longevity of its house, or was it more for selfish and self serving purposes that he mm -hmm. acted in that way? Um, I've got, uh, I'll, I'll throw that one to you first, Matt, but I've got a supplementary Blood Raven question here, uh, okay. that I also want to put to you. Uh, but what what do you think? Was he was he trying to do it for the sake of the Targaryens or or what? I think that at a conscious level, Blood Raven always was telling himself he was doing it to maintain the House Targaryen. Maybe he had more prophetic dreams like we've been talking about. He had a sense of the White Walkers, that kind of thing. He's definitely one of the most objectively magical characters, even before he becomes the weirwood god that he does. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's always convincing himself that he's doing everything for the good of House Targaryen and his family. But I think there's definitely a sense that he has a real problem with certain people, particularly the um, the offspring of Damon Blackfire and everyone that has anything to do with Bitter Steel. And it's called out in the Mystery Night where everyone in the realm's like, man, Blood Raven's spending a lot of time caring only about the Blackfires when they're like a joke at this point. And then Blood Raven as Maynard Plum comes back and says like, well, no, it's like, it's deserved kind of. It's like, he's like, I don't need to care about what's going on with the, with the red Kraken or anything. Cause you know, the, Bl the Blackfires are a serious problem. And then you look at him later when he's talking to Bran, all of his regrets are about things he did with his family in turn, especially with, um, losing Cher Seastar at some point, never being able to marry her. The idea that there's a brother he hated and a brother he loved and a, a sense that he does feel like he screwed up. And yeah, I, I think there's really a high level of sense of the two Blood Ravens perception of himself that as a young man, he definitely thought he was always just doing the right thing for House Targaryen as he got older. And he's like, you know, a lot of the stuff was really just for me. Yeah, and you actually started talking about the thing I was going to ask you about as well as the kind of the follow up, which is what I've been increasingly thinking about. I'm I'm a I'm a big Blood Raven conspiracy nut. Um, uh, if, if if I have to have a tinfoil hat about anything, it's even doubt playing Blood Raven. Um, but the the more you look at what Blood Raven does, it's not just about dealing with the Starks and the Wall and things going on up there. He does, it would appear, send uh, the Woods Witch to reignite this flame of prophecy with the Targaryens by by having this prince that was promised prophecy. Um, that certainly, as far as I am concerned, is coming from him. So he is a Targaryen, uh, as well as being a Green Seer. Is he that this is now where my new conspiracy is going? I haven't yet figured out exactly what I'm going to call it, but is he actually this nexus of these two types of magic that is both the the the, the green seer children of the forest type and also this long running um Targaryen that George R. R. Martin is now trying to show us this thread of Targaryen prophecy uh, about them being uh the the family that somehow is saving the world is he the sort of the nexus the heart of all of this bringing it all together it's interesting that you think that they're different robert that they're not one and the same well that's the thing and i think that perhaps he is the thing bringing it together being the point of uh, pulling them together because the 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 north remembers and all of this 
generally speaking, is like we've got the wall, we've got the dragon glass. The Targaryens don't tend to think about the wall and dragon glass. They are thinking about the prince that was promised, though. Uh, so, how how is the, the 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 how are the two sides being brought together? Um, how can I possibly crowbar Blood Raven into the center of yet another theory? I think it's deserved to, to crowbar him in, and especially the children of the forest, that the relationships of the dragons to the weirwoods and the way that the weirwoods and the children seem to so much want to control the Targaryens, literally through Alice Rivers and Aemond, but much more uh, in an indirect way throughout the rest of their history. I talk about this in the second half of my video, talking about dragon dreams. I start off talking about just like, what are they, glass candles, that kind of thing. And then I sort of get into the thing you're talking about, like how much of the Targaryen history was being controlled by the children. Were these uh, prophetic dreams they were getting, are they even real or are they just manipulations being sent by someone like Bran or Bloodraven or the rest of the children? Like, it's a fascinating question because jo the way George puts it into his story is he allows green dreams to show up and Bran thinks they're real. And then you find out, no, they're actually being sent mostly by Bloodraven and the children that are underneath his tree. And then you learn more about other prophetic dreams and then he tells you, no, glass candles exist. You can fake those too. And it's like, boy, George, it's like you're trying to tell us that there's something strange going on with these dragon dreams and then you should pay attention to maybe where they're coming from. And I think that's sort of getting to your point of is he like the architect of the entire history of his own family? Did Blood Raven create himself? That kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going quite that far. Did Blood Raven create himself? But uh, I like it. Um, maybe I should. Uh, I'm just trying to think about the good. The Ouroboros, the dragon eating its own tail. That's the Targaryen. So, yeah, so closed time loop, uh, which George R. R. Martin does like doing. Um, I should just say Terra Incognito, uh, Incognita uh, said, is there going to be a gap between the stream and the premiere or will I have to leave early <laughs> to take the pup to the park? I should have said this at the beginning. Um, uh, indeed, I should have said this to Matt before we went on air because I didn't tell him how long we were going to go on for. Um, but uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, the, the, pre the episode is launching in two hours from now. My intention is not to go all the way up to there. You'll probably be delighted to hear. Um, we're, we've got only like a couple more questions to go. So uh, with all of these pre-show live streams, the idea is that um, we'll leave it off at some point, probably within the next half hour or so, but enough time for everyone to go away, make themselves a nice cup of tea, walk the dog, come back, settle down and enjoy the episode. So that's, so that's the idea. Uh, no, we're not going all the way. Um, uh, up to uh, the uh, the actual launch itself. I have to um, sign up for Max, so I have to leave at some point. Well, okay. Well, there we go. We, we, we're we as I say, we've got one more question from my patrons, and then let, we'll try and pick up a couple more in the chat, uh, and then uh, that's probably it. George R. R. Tolkien uh, saying, "Salutations, Robert. I've uh, a Song of Ice and Fire question. What's up with the mountain?" Uh, we talked about this, well, mentioned this slightly earlier on. Um, last I remember, he got his head chopped off, uh, but someone in Dawn said, if you didn't see him die, how do you know he's dead? Do you think he will be in the winds of winter? Now, my take on uh, the mountain, uh, I'll be interested whether yours differs on this, is that I think that he was killed by the poison um, uh, that was there by the Red Viper over in Martell. I think that uh, Kyburn obviously took him down and did try to sort of keep him going, but um, eventually they decided he did die and they did chop off his head. A head did go to Dawn. Uh, it was an extraordinary, or a skull did. It was an extraordinarily large skull. Um, I personally see no reason why that isn't his skull. I know I've, there are some conspiracy theories out there that perhaps it isn't, but I see no reason why it isn't. Um, the Robert Strong, this character who is clearly the zombie mountain, um, it's very noticeable that he's got his helmet on at all times. He never eats. Uh, when people look, they cannot see his eyes. I am reasonably certain that if you, yeah, if you unwelded his helmet from the rest of his suit of armor, you would find he actually doesn't even have a head. That's what I'm I'm pretty sure is going on there. Um, uh, but the this is 
this is basically Kyburn going full Frankenstein and creating his uh, science white. Uh, and this is, as I've said before, a prototype. And we shouldn't forget the fact that he's created a prototype with two books still to come. Um, where he can create one, he can definitely create others. So do not expect this to be the the end of what Kyburn is doing. But uh, Matt, that's my take. Is Have you got a different slant on what's going on with the mountain? So I do think he still has his head. I, I think the head that was sent down to Dorne is that... Cersei has been collecting heads for quite a while when her hunt for Tyrion, and they just sent an abnormally large skull down there and are totally tricking them. Um, I think what's going on is maybe he doesn't have eyes anymore. That would be something. Or maybe they rotted out of his head or something like that. But the idea is that George has showed us in multiple instances that different forms of magic, as it were, all have the ability to raise somebody from undeath. And there's a particular weirdness to some of the claims, like from the uh, Faith of R'hllor. One of the things they say is that when Zorahai comes and the Prince that has promised returns, like they're going to raise the dead into undeath. And it's one of those things that has sort of stuck into my head for quite a while. Like, what would you use an undead corpse for? Well, you do what the others are doing, right? You'd use them as soldiers. That, that's or, or cheap labor soldiers that kind of thing and i'm wondering if uh robert strong or the mountain uh as he actually is is sort of a throwback to maybe an older time in this world where um not just the others but other necromancers basically used to have soldiers like him walking around and it's it's, all, it's almost sort of like a call coming with inside the house sort of thing, where it's like, well, yeah, we're we're going to fight the undead beyond the wall, but there's undead here too. Beric Dondarrion exists, Stoneheart exists. It's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, as to what George is doing with him, I don't really know. <laughs> like, why would you make the zombie mountain? Um, I, I guess you could make more of him, I suppose. Is that the thing that Kyburn's going to do? He's going to set up a little shop in the basement. He's going to start making them or something like that. I don't know. My, um, in terms of like how it works, God, who knows? How does how do fire whites work, Robert? How did how how did Beric Dondarrion stand up and how did his body seal itself back up? I don't know. Well, George R. R. Martin always says there are two answers to that. Um, so the. <laughs> Psychic it's, powers or I should scroll back to earlier on in the in the stream if you want to know what that was about. My my take on Kyburn though is he's he is the pure scientist. Mm. He's we know that that he he just studies. He's fascinated by this idea of what comes after life, mm -hmm. and there's this amazing conversation he has with Jamie when he gives this example of he says if you go into a room and there's a chair in there and it's got an indentation and there's you know, a smell of perfume in the air, you know that a woman had been sat there, but she's gone. And it's what lingers of her. And that's like what happens after death is something lingers. And we see that across in uh, Lady Stoneheart as a random example. What lingers of Catelyn Stark this is the rage, the anger, the need for revenge. That is what has lingered. Um, and so what Kyburn is doing is he's experimenting. He's he's figuring out what is it, what can what keeps going, what hangs around after somebody dies. So I think he's he is just doing an experiment. He's he's created this thing and then he will do more experiments and create more things. And it's not that he's there trying desperately thinking you know what i wish to create a zombie army i think he's there going i just want to discover stuff and now i've i've got a body and now i'll do something else over here and so we'll get something else different and weird and slightly disconcerting it's a very lovecraft idea you, you use frankenstein but lovecraft who is one of uh, george's favorite authors constantly wrote around about these kind of kyburn like characters who would just experiment wildly with undeath and I, 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 like you just said, people would ask him, like, what are you doing? And they'd say, like, I don't know. I'm seeing what I can do. And that's that's what it's all about. It's like, boy, does that suck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And this also makes him a really hard character to 
to sort of um it's, yeah because those guys don't want anything they just yeah, want exactly how far they can push the borders why yeah what are you doing george <laughs> what's kyburn doing and i wonder you get the impression yeah you get the impression that you, he's He's a social climber, not so much because he wants the power, but it's just that he wants to get back to a place where he can have everything that he needs to do his research. And that seems to be what he's actually there. He makes himself useful to Cersei because Cersei gives him all the things that he needs to do the things that he wants to do. Um, he, 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 she gives him people. Exactly. Yeah. Um <laughs> Kaziglu Bay, thank you very much uh, for the donation. We're at eight hundred and seventy-nine dollars, uh, everyone. I just wanted to say, which is uh, astonishing, just for uh, uh, one one you know, a couple of hours we've been on here. So, uh, thank you so much if you have been donated. There is there's still time. We'll we'll pick up a couple of quick questions in the chat, but there is still time to donate for a fantastic cause, um, uh, which is Alzheimer's care and research. It's a horrible disease, and a little bit of a uh, little bit support goes a hugely long way so uh, thank you very much to everyone who has been uh, doing that um let's just quickly flick through um sort of born 75 saying i'm part way through a feast for crows i'm looking forward to meeting lady stoneheart properly yeah i don't know whether you look forward to meeting lady stoneheart but uh, yeah it'll be a, a, a fun thing um Clueless Fangirl saying Kyburn is partly like Da Vinci and other Renaissance scientists. Uh, yeah, I get that. A yeah. slightly dark one, I would so, say. She more like made up war machines to support the rest of the stuff he did. Kyburn's just like making the war machines. Yes, because he wants to um, as much as anything else. Uh, Mark Mark Agrippa saying he has a, a medieval Nikola Tesla with no morals. Um uh, yeah. Okay. That's uh, okay. I think that's um, up to date with the chat. Why don't we, uh, Matt? Is there anything you want to sort of signpost people to that you're you're doing on your channel, or um, where where can people find you on the on the internet? Just all the all the places. Uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel, YouTube.com/slash Joe Magician. That's right. I have the, the little channel link. I'm one of those special people. Which you can get at over a thousand subscribers, I think. It's not actually that special. Uh, for House of the Dragon, we're going to be doing live streams after every episode, directly afterwards. So like a uh, a live reaction thing. So the episode starts at nine, and I'll be live at ten fifteen. We're going to do that for every single one, and then um, for the rest of the season, going to try going to put out one video per week at least, like a full length. I'm not sure if it's going to be. This is the thing I was I was struggling with because you know I make a lot of theories, but you can't really theorize about a known quantity like this. Mm. It's it's really hard to do. So maybe like reviews or explainers or something like that. Um, I kind of did a theory video with the um, the dragon dream thing. There's a there's a lot of speculation in that one in the second half. It sort of catches people by surprise. They're like, oh, he's just sort of going over it. I'm like, what about free will and destiny? And kind of kind of mess with some people's heads. Um, also you can find all of it on the podcast feed. I rip all these audios from streams and videos and I put them up at the wit and wisdom of Joe Magician because I am so, so full of myself. I chose that name for the podcast feed. So if you can't ever catch it live, you can catch it there. And Ooh, what else? Also, I'm a moderator on the song of ice and fire subreddit. So if you act out, I'll ban you. Don't be that guy. Don't make <laughs> do it i don't want to mod be nice don't make me mod that kind of thing um and there's also uh actually well robert have you ever seen the ass waffle have you seen this before i, I don't know i can't see what it is you're let me see if i can get it D design I, I have seen that yes yeah, the ass waffle <laughs> So this is the objectively correct way to pronounce uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, the acronym A-S-O-I-A-F. Ass Peach Waffle. There you go. Uh, I have a threadless shop for that stuff, but I just think it's funny. I want more people to know about that. I've been trying for years now to get George to, to acknowledge the existence. That was the question I sent with the season of Shea. I, I wanted to ask George, how do you pronounce, if you had to pronounce those letters as an acronym, how would you do it? They didn't get to it, unfortunately. They said that George uh, talked for way, 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 way too long about everything. So they only got half their questions done. But one day, 
I'm going to get George to acknowledge the ass waffle. He's already acknowledged hot D. We're going to get this on the on the table too. Well, I, I hereby commit, and the to if I ever get the chance to uh, to interview him, it's a it's a long shot, but hey, he is now talking to people at last. Um, if I ever do, then I will I will happily ask him that question as the 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 one to round it all off. Uh, to the the question that's burning in the fandom. George um, pronounces these letters phonetically. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Awesome source um uh for the donation uh karina stricker uh sean um uh there was uh, there was sean someone uh it was just appeared off of my um uh screen there but thank you uh, uh sean uh Gikas for, as well for the donation thank you that's uh very uh kind of you what's uh okay let's end on this final question reflective ramblings picking up question for emma shyman what is one unanswered question that you don't want answered in House of the Dragon, because this is a fascinating one. So is there anything that you're happy to remain a mystery? You go first. <laughs> I know, now, having asked the question, I've just thought, is there anything that I don't, I'm, I'm happy to remain a mystery. I think, um, so I don't know whether it can, it's a mystery, but there's the, when you get the fight, the battle above the God's Eye Lake, and uh, they never discover the body of, of Damon Targaryen, and that some people have got this theory that he sort of uh, escaped somehow. I, I don't, I don't want to know that he actually escaped or anything like that. I just like the idea that actually, you know, sometimes uh, that's there. Actually, I've got an even better one. I've got a better one. As we're on the theme of the God's Eye Lake, Adam Valarion. Uh, flies on his dragon and lands on the Isle of Faces. I actually, and we don't know what happened. He flies away again afterwards, gets into a battle and dies. Annoying for everyone. So he never tells anyone what he, what what he, he did, what he experienced. I am very happy for that to remain an absolute mystery. Unless George specifically comes out with something that he wants us all to know. Um, I'm happy for that to be a complete mystery and we just see the dragon landing and then see it coming back up again and it's like, well, what happened there? Okay, I got one. It's uh, when Jace Valarian goes to Winterfell, one of the, there's a bunch of stories about what he did there and one of them is that he supposedly married Cregan Stark's half-sister. I think that's what she mm -hmm. is. Sarah Snow, Sarah Snow yeah. And there's also a story that he supposedly went down into the crypts for some reason. And nobody knows why he did that because there's no reason to, he has no connection to the Winterfell crypts. And there's stories that he left a dragon egg down there. I would love it if they show Jace going into the crypts with Sarah Snow and you don't see what happens. Like obviously the suggestion will be maybe that they perhaps, uh, you know, made the dragon with two backs as it were, or maybe she's just showing off the, the crypts or something like that. But it would be fascinating if they leave it ambiguous of some parts of the pact of ice and fire scenario that goes on with Jason Cregan and Sarah Snow. Excellent answer. Okay. I think uh, with that, we will start to draw this one to a close um, in terms of stuff I've got coming up. Um, I will be doing my breakdown of the episode um, within 24 hours of the episode itself. So um, uh keep an eye out for that i will also be doing as i said a little bit earlier i'm going to be doing an, uh, a video exploring this whole idea of the dragon dreams and what the, all of this kind of targaryen prophecy stuff is is all about what's what's george r, r. martin actually driving at with all of this so that's coming up um and for those who are wondering i am going to be covering both this house of the dragon and the rings of power um i'm not going to sleep for the next 10 weeks um uh, uh it's uh, but it's really it, i'm finding this a really exciting time if you told me three four years ago that we would have both of these amazing worlds back on our screens then wow i, I would have bitten your hand off it's something i'm really excited about so um uh, I will be covering both of them. I will be doing two live streams a week if you're a fan of the live streams. So my normal Thursday live streams will be carrying on, but they are all going to be turning into pre-shows for the Rings of Power because the Rings of Power will be dropping overnight on the Thursday to Friday. Um, and I will carry on doing these Sundays for the duration of House of the Dragon, these Sunday live streams as well, pre-show. And I'll be trying to get... Um, uh, a, a, 
some special guests uh, uh, every single week. If there are people that you particularly like to have uh, on there, then just leave a, something down in the comments below and I'll see what I can do. No promises, no promises, but uh, I, I will certainly try and get a few exciting people. For tonight, but later in the season as we go, uh, going to do some live reactions and stuff like that. Um, so far, History of Westeros, Radio Westeros, um, Girls Gone Cannon, um, Not a Cast. I think San Rixian is going to come on for one. So it's it's going to be it's going to be a party, same sort of thing. We're all going to party on each other's channels the, these two months of hell. I mean, of fun. <laughs> these are not going to be overwhelming and a lot of work, and we're going to come out of it refreshed and awesome, just like we were beforehand. Robert's not going to have a a mental breakdown during this. Nope. The, the the gray is going to extend all the way up to there. I, I think that's probably what's going to happen. Um, what what I was going to do normally was just say where. Uh, ask my guest each time where where do you recommend for a post show live stream? But I think the answer is on Joe Magician's channel. Um, so uh, if you if the if you're watching live moderators, could you pop a link to that? If you're watching a little bit later on, uh, there is a link down in the description to Matt's channel. Okay, and I think with that we will uh, draw this to a close. I'll make you disappear for one second so I can point at some things. If you are watching this back a little bit later, as here peering, always get this the wrong way around, around here is going to be a link to other live streams and appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to my Patreon page. Patreon is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. Um, okay, I shall bring Matt back just in time to say goodbye. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, moderators. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you, everyone, for donating. We've raised a huge amount of money. At the moment, $922. Thank you so much. That is uh, fantastic. Take care, everyone, and I will see you again next time.